Hey, brand new BirdCast, everybody. I don't need glasses. I'm not reading shit. Fully Loaded Comedy Festival is on sale right now. We are adding people. Secret time. We were drunk at a bar last night. And someone committed to the first run. <laughs> His name rhymes with Payne Willis. <laughs> We're adding comics as we go. We added Joey Diaz last week. We got David Tell, Mark Norman, Big J Oakson, Taylor Tomlinson, Fortune Feimster, Nikki Glazer, Sal Volcano. I'm sure I'm forgetting someone. The list is awesome. This is going to be the biggest party of the summer. You're not going to want to miss it. Speaking of parties, Cinco de Mayo at the Greek. If you haven't gotten your tickets, get them now. We are almost sold out. Cinco de Mayo at the Greek. Me, Metalachi. Mark Norman, I think secret time. I think Sam Rell's going to come do a spot secret time. All right. Uh, that's all my announcements. Birdie Boy World Tour. Birdie Boy Relapse World Tour is uh, is still going. We have like two, three more weeks left. And then I am taking a much needed break. Went to the doctor. Got my blood panels. Got my blood pressure. Everything's good. We can run through this tour and I won't die. I was worried. I was worried for a second there. I know you guys were too. I saw the comments. Jesus Christ, Bert, how red are your fucking cheeks? You know, it was New York. We were partying. What the fuck are you going to do? What the fuck are you going to do? Wouldn't you do it? Wouldn't you do it? If I give you a week and I was like, hey, man, I'm going to put you up at the Soho Grand and uh, you're going to party with the funniest people in the world for the next week. Or you can just read a book. Come on. What the fuck are you going to do? And you know that you're healthy. And you by the way, my real goal, because I've said this to myself, by the way, I'm, I'm sorry this is a little long. Uh, today's podcast is Josh Peck, but I'm here. We're in Nashville at the uh, Grand Old Opry. We have one show tonight, and uh, we have two shows at the Ryman tomorrow, and this is a benchmark in my career. Uh, a few years ago, I was with Ari and Nate Bargatze, and we went and saw Angela Johnson and Larry the Cable Guy at the Ryman. And I remember saying to myself, I can't imagine that this is in the books for my career. I said, if you ever gave me an opportunity to perform here, I remember Angela Johnson, you know, Angela's had a famous nail salon bit. And I, and I, Ari was like, do you think she's going to tell the nail salon bit? And I literally said, if the machine story could get me to the Ryman, that's like a, I mean, that's, that's the original Grand Old Opry. By the way, this Grand Old Opry is gorgeous. I'm blown away that I'm getting the opportunity to perform at the Ryman and at the Grand Old Opry and at the Greek and at Red Rocks. And at all these places, I am really, I'm, I feel very privileged because I, this career wasn't always this. It was, it was a lot of sh shit show back in the day. And I want to thank every single one of you who listen weekly to this podcast um, because, because you guys afford me the opportunity to do these shows that I love. And I love stand up, obviously. Um, and I love this podcast and I love Two Bears, One Cave and I love, I love everything. I'm feeling I'm feeling very grateful today. And I'm I'm also going to lose weight before I turn 50. I will be let's make it go weight, Peter. Right. 220. Okay, maybe not 220. The way you said that. How about 225? 225 when I'm when I turn 50. I mean, I will, I got to fucking do something with these guys. Be, be honest though. I know my face looks fat as fuck, but this arm Looks fucking jacked. That's muscle right there. Today's podcast is with a dude who talking about weight loss who lost, I think, like 150 pounds. Josh Peck. Josh is, here's the thing, is I know Josh from social media, from Vine, from Jason Nash. I know him from all of these things. I knew Josh and Drake or Drake and Josh. The girls had watched it a little bit, but we talk about it in a sec. The girls were like, yeah, it wasn't really our thing because I think they were too young and it was boys. Um, we were more a wizard of Waverly Place family. And uh, and then I found out the night before that he was in the movie The Wackness. It was one of my favorite movies. He was fucking awesome. And it just kind of bums me out to know that he was almost at his lowest. He was in there with Method Man. He tells a great Method Man story. Uh, ben Kingsley was in it with him. He tells a great Ben Kingsley story. He's a great fucking podcast guest. I would have him back any day. He's sober. Talks about his sobriety in this. Talks about his wife. His wife, you know who his wife's dad is? Ken O'Brien. He is a great dude. He's got a book out right now. 
The book is Happy People Are Annoying. You can get it at Amazon.com. There will be a link in this description underneath. Um, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, my friend, author, actor, podcaster, social media guru, Josh Peck. Can I tell you what's so interesting? I have been following you for a while. I think maybe from Vine. Yeah. Because of Jason Nash. Yeah, sure. Gotcha. And um but and and so I and I and I know I know about I know about your your career, but just because you would that you know, it's like fucking last night. I'm in the car with my wife and I'm I Google, I go to your inst or your whatchamacallit and it says Ben Kingsley. And I'm like, Ben Kingsley, what the fuck did you do with Ben Kingsley? Because I, I love Ben Kingsley. Yeah, it's best. Dude, The Wackness is one of my favorite movies. Oh, man. I didn't realize that was you. No You're way. You're so fucking good in that. Because you, you know, what's so interesting is I know you, I know of your career through the Nickelodeon stuff and then, and then the Vine, the, the YouTube, the, the, the social media stuff. Dude, you are you. You fucking killed it in the wackness. That is the Dude. fucking one of my favorite movies. You were so fucking good in it. You did this. You you had this vulnerability in that movie that was so relatable. It was such a great fucking movie. Thank you. And I'm sitting here going, like I'm in the car last night going, <laughs> and I played the trailer. My wife's like, should we watch it? And I was like, you won't get it. I, you think uh, my wife won't get it she no. my wife doesn't get things i think she <laughs> willfully doesn't get things i think she enjoys sure. not getting things yeah pleasantly not getting that and that movie kind of was designed i feel like it was a story told for for boys a uh, little bit I, I, the music the hip-hop the time right the the weed everything was about that and then and then i'm you know and by the way your fucking team this is a great little one page oh it's, good it's a great one page but they were like that's when you were at your lowest and i was like wait what little bit yeah i mean certainly at like the height of my sort of drug days really but it probably worked you know art imitating reality in that way it was... your your mouth in that movie because because I, and i say this because i i have an open I, my, i'm a mouth breather me too is that because you, do you have a bite problem because i have a bite issue what's your I, I, by the way i have so many bite issues right? <laughs> i'm going to the dentist after this are you yeah to, because i only have two teeth that touch right now I, I have an underbite, and so I don't. I like literally look like Cro Magnum, like, like I didn't evolve. Correctly. I have an overbite, uh, but it's you have an open bite. Look, me too. Look. Yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. yeah, all day. Your mouth in that. I know that sounds crazy, but like, <laughs> it's just it. It spoke volumes of the character mm -hmm. and his vulnerability. And I, I am a mouth breather, and so I, I will catch myself at my most vulnerable with my mouth just wide open, just talking to someone. Like my my lip oh. hanging down, and it's funny. It's it, that for whatever reason I identified with that character, and you got to work with Method Man, and I think Method Man's fucking the best, dude. He's. I remember we were. I don't think this is speaking out of school. We're doing press for the movie, and we're we're doing like a press junket, and he says to the publicist, like, "Yo, I need that backpack of mine that was in the car when I got here," and she goes, "Oh, the car." went for the day like we're gonna have a new car come pick you up he goes nah 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 like that backpack has forty thousand dollars in cash in it like i need that now and i was like someone better get method man his money <laughs> what, what is it with hip-hop guys and cash that it's such a like i never have cash on me really i never have cash on me i never i don't have credit cards anymore mm. i don't have i uh apple pay what are you doing crypto I, no i do i don't buy things <laughs> no i really honestly i like I don't know. My my world is a little bit. Uh, You're famous. I don't know about that. I mean, I guess I am, but the but I I have a team. I, well, I'm always on the road, and then yeah. when I'm home, I'm never. I never go anywhere. So what if I'm on the road, I have an assistant, a tour manager, and my cousin Andrew. Everyone's got company cards, so they always pick up the tab. Right. And um, that's famous guy shit. A little bit. I don't know. <laughs> a little uh, bit. <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it does sound, now that you're saying that i'm like yeah I, but yeah but i and like last night we went to dinner i didn't even bring an, a wallet and someone was like i'm just so used to not having a wallet not even thinking where my wallet is yeah that um what about id i feel like famous people never have id 
you know what's so funny is I do not ever have an ID. Yeah. Like, you if don't I don't have it. my wallet and and I have not needed an ID f- for anything really. Even like at the airport, it's <laughs> it's clear. Right. So and and I go through a different I go through a different entrance. So Wow. Yeah. So um Is it the there's that famous guy wing at LAX now, right? Like and it's a special yeah. special waiting room. It's well it yeah, it's expensive by the way, just so we're clear. Oh, I've heard it's quite expensive. Yeah. It's uh yeah. well it's not it's it's very doable if you if you're flying by yourself, but you no one ever really is, but if you're flying by yourself, six hundred bucks extra. Hmm. Yeah. Per but you gotta flight. buy you gotta buy the membership. Right. Membership's where it is they get you. So it's membership and then you're also paying six hundred on top. I think. I don't know. To be dead honest with you, I kinda didn't I didn't even ask. I know I like <laughs> certain things I don't even want to know about because I go because I got it the first time I got it, my parents were coming out and I knew that you could go in that way and out that way. And so I said, Hey, I know I'd done it before. I'd done it on influencer shit. Not mm-hmm. that I was an influencer, but I remember reaching out to them and saying, Hey, we're gonna shoot a video. We'd love to try this thing out. And they're like, yeah. and they comped that and flew me in a helicopter home. And I just put it in social media. Gorge. And I was like, fuck yeah, it was great. Yeah. And then uh and then the next time my parents were coming out and I was like, Hey, reach out to that company and see if they can I can have my parents because what they do is when you land they grab you off the plane and take you over there yeah. and they grab your bags for you and then they put you in a car and take you home and then when you fly out you go there and so i told my parents and I, they did it for my parents and then i was like and this was like the heat of covid and we were still touring doing the driving tour- tours right and so i was like i was like hey can i'm gonna i think i'm gonna do that and that way i can keep my team in our bubble keep us safe and so we started doing it and then it just and then it, and then it it, it subtracted all airport anxiety from me and so i was like i'm gonna keep doing it yeah it's sort of the key to everything i mean now i've got a credit card that gets me into the delta sky club i don't mean to brag but even (laughs) then i'm just like this is played out i mean i i feel like it's rich people problems but you go in there and i'm like this is just sort of like a a crappy cracker board and like a bunch of people who think that they're fancy like take rolling calls i'll tell you let me uh are you ready for this this is my this is my fucking moment. <laughs> I had it the other day. Guy was a baller sitting in first class. Yeah. And he was treating people. I can I get can I get a drink up here? And she goes, I'm give me one second, sir. And he was like, You pay a lot of money for these tickets. No. You know? And and I and I was sitting next to him and he's he was acting important. And I said, uh, I said, Man, you should just fly private. And he was like, What? I said, You should fly private. And he goes, uh, he goes, oh, what, what do you think that costs? It was uh, Austin to L.A. I said, it's $23,000. And he said, how would you know that? And I said, because I almost flew, flew private. But now i got to sit next to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And, and I wish I had flew private. I can't, I can't pull the trigger on private. I have a really hard time with that. Yeah, when, what, <clears throat> uh, you got to be Rogan level to do private all the time. Well, Rogan has to do private. I mean, private right. is private is a... An ex- private is... is for people who cannot be around people because it becomes problematic. Yes. Like Rogan can't fly commercial. Yeah. Can he, he can't fly commercial in life. He can't live a commercial life. Uh, I mean, he's, he's changed his, I don't think he met, did it on purpose. I, re, I really don't think he did, but he made his life problematic for, for being in the public eye. Like he cannot, he cannot go into an airport. I mean, meaning, too many people would want to stop take pictures with him, but then you'd also have people wanting to give them a piece of his mind, of their mind. Yeah, like it would just be bad. Yeah, he's getting it every direction. And like, uh, like Tom, Tom doesn't fly commercial. Segura doesn't fly commercial. Really? Ever? Ever? Segura, I feel like could, and I mean, no hate on Segura, he's a man, yeah. but like, I feel like you know he wears the right baseball cap. No one ever <laughs> recognizes him ever because he looks like a dad he Dude, looks like an every dad he's me and him were in an elevator to get together and i mean he'll do he'll, he'll tell you this i get recognized all the time i'm sure but i think because i'm approachable and people know i'm approachable yeah so they don't mind doing two take looks at me mm. and then going oh i know you so and i were in an elevator and the guy the guy goes oh shit looks at tom he goes you're the machine <laughs> and i'm standing right next to tom and tom goes i am not and then he looks at me and goes, you're the machine. And I go, I am. Tom, 
But Tom is also he's doing very he's doing arenas, so that that's one yeah. reason he flies private. And he and Tom does not have a money a problem investing reinvesting money in himself. He does not have a problem spending money. It I have a real problem spending money. I do too. But do you come from none? No, I came from money. Mm, little, not, little not money, but like. But you were living nice in Tampa. Oh yeah, my dad was a lawyer. My mom was a teacher. Um, Good we, benefits. Yeah, we our house was three hundred fifty thousand dollars, which was a lot back then. I think maybe it was one hundred eighty thousand dollars. We in club sports. Uh, played tennis, played golf, played uh, Rich baseball. Sports, yeah, I was see, I was I'm different than you. I was an athlete and who, uh, had had the performance bug. Mm. Whereas I feel like you, from what I know, were performance based. Basically, I mean, I, not to tell you your story, but mm. it, like. Basically, based on living in New York, single mother, and kind of just—I mean, I listened to you. Uh, I've listened to you talk on a bunch of podcasts now, but uh, and so I don't think I, if I felt like sports wasn't going to get be an option for you. No, I, and I was a chubby asthmatic. Like, thank God I had performing because what else was it going to be like math? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. it just wasn't looking good for me. But I, yeah, when I found comedy, it just was like this natural sort of. I mean, you know, I, I say in my book like. You can be a, too much of a lot of things. You can be too nice, too emotional, but you're never n too funny. Like, it's never a thing. No, you can never be too funny. And it's a magic trick, right? Like, when it's done well, people are like, oh, my God, do it again. Like, where did this come from? I, I, I You started performing when you were, what, like 10? 10. Yeah. Stand-up clubs in New York. And so I wonder, did we never even passed. I, I never saw you because I think you were already doing all that i said i got flown out to do the amanda show when i was like 12 amanda Bynes. yeah amanda yeah. Bynes, and that's what brought me out to la but i started at 10 doing like five minutes at stand up new york and catch a rising star and gotham and like i just had this tight five minutes and then i wound up doing it on conan and rosie o'donnell and it was like my shtick the kid comedian and and you were out doing television by the time by like 90 no i'm, I'm trying to think timeline wise 99 you were out already out doing television right yeah 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 99 or like right after i was like post bar mitzvah and i remember that i got like the call from the president of nickelodeon he's like i'm gonna fly you and your mom to la and you're gonna be on the amanda show and my mom being like the single mom and me being an only child like if i had a dad in the mix he would have been like what what about algebra yeah what about our life here and my mom was like we're going like, if we hate it, we'll come back. But we should do this because this never happens. Yeah. And six months after the Amanda show, we made Drake and Josh. And that was kind of the thing that changed my life. That what uh, your relationship with your mom seems complicated, but yet very close. Super, super close. I mean, it, I think no matter what, if you're that close, there has to be some complication to it. Right. And then in some ways she gave up her life for me. And then in other ways, like I still was just a kid. And mm -hmm. so we've always sort of like navigated those waters, but she, yeah, I'd be, she was my custom auto. Like without her, I, I would have been nowhere, no matter how much sometimes we butt heads, but that's just being like hot blooded Jews. We can't yeah. help ourselves. You're, you're I, not to like, not to tell your story back to you, but the things that fascinate me is a uh, single mother because your father had another family. Oh yeah. Big time. And he was older. He was like in his early 60s. And your mom was 45 when she had you? Uh, 43. 43, yeah. So my dad was like 62. I say in the book, like he was getting Medicare and chicks pregnant. <laughs> and then like my mom and him hooked up one time. They'd been like sort of business acquaintances. And then he had this well-timed separation of six hours with just enough time to hook up with my mom and then take her out to dinner. And she got pregnant. And he was like, wait, I'm 62. Like, my kids are grown. My life is good. Yeah. So the moment she said she was pregnant, he was like, I'm out to rap. Like, we're done. And I I never met him. And he passed away. And I never got to meet him. You, uh, I, I, not, to, I, not to get serious, but but one of my, as I think in, uh, you'll uh, appreciate this. Yeah. As a comic, one of the, the things that are authentically unique to an experience where you go, who that's I, this is odd. This is an odd pairing. Was that you said um, how you felt when he you found out he died that you were mourning, you were mourning someone that you'd never met. Yeah. Or explain explain that if you can because that that is so juicy to me. Yeah. 
it it seemed unfair because throughout most of my life, I just figured like you can't miss something you never had. And or I knew so many men who had issues with their dad and they're like, you never met your dad. Like, fuck, I wish I never met my dad. <laughs> Cause like, you know, dads can be the worst sometimes. Yeah. And, uh, and so, but what happened was throughout my life, I loved having this like emotional grenade that I knew that I could just show up in his life. Cause I like knew he lived in Florida, like most older Jewish guys. Yeah. Like, and I was like, oh, at any moment I could unleash this like grenade on his life and show up and, blow up his spot with his kids and all of a sudden he's not like cool country club guy like he's the guy like who was a philandering dickhead his family never knew about you i assume not just because they're like a big family and, and you know them you've seen them on facebook and stuff yeah i've seen them on facebook and i'm not exactly hiding so i assume they probably want to be like oh uh, we should probably meet the guy from drake and josh who's also our half brother do, do you think they know it's you i don't know no i don't think they know that's i mean that's insane to me because there might be someone listening going there's no way that was my dad. And then it's their dad. Dude, I think through writing this stupid book, there's 100% a chance I'm going to meet these people now. And never did I have a desire. I'm not against it, but I wasn't yeah. seeking it out. But my buddy, Brian Koppelman, who, who read Brian the book. Brian Koppelman? What a fucking name. Yeah, I mean. I love you know, Brian Koppelman. Dude, he's a man. The other day he reached out and he was like, hey, my niece is sitting next to you. And I, and I was, and, but I'd already left. No, I love Brian Koppelman. I love, I mean, yeah. yeah. And for anyone who doesn't know, he, he, you know, wrote the movie Rounders and the Oceans movies and now Billions and Super Pump crushing it. And, and when he read the book, because my whole thing was always like, I have no intention to meet my siblings because I don't want to blow up for them whatever image they had of their dad. Because oh, that's so fucking, that is very, uh, for lack of better words, Christian of you. <laughs> I would us. never do that. <laughs> <laughs> what would you do would you how would you show up give us a play-by-play well let me because I've, I've actually been thinking about this all morning i don't uh i don't cheat on my wife because i want everything to be per i have a perfection thing mm. yeah my, i got a green light last night i'm doing this podcast with whitney this week and they're playing truth or dare and i said and and leanne's like hey just so you know truth or dare like you can't kiss anyone i said i wouldn't kiss anyone i said but what if jenna aniston shows up can i kiss her she goes, yeah, you can kiss Jennifer Aniston. I was like, okay, cool. Solid. So yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm, and so Jennifer Aniston is my one out. Did you look into it like a peck? Or are we talking like a little? Uh, like I'm, a not even gonna, I'm not even going to question. I'm uh, going full fucking tilt. Yeah, you got I'll it. brush my teeth and everything. Solid. And so, but I was thinking about that today. And I was thinking about your, uh, your, there is a thing that happens when you get successful where you start going, yeah, I, I bet you wish there's a that you get a year of it, a year of, of being real shitty. Yeah. When you get some success, where you start saying, "Yeah, I bet you wish you had paid attention to me, yeah. to your dad in your head." And I was wondering how you felt about that when you started blowing up, and you were like, "Did you ever say to your mom, do you does he do you think he knows this is me? Do you think he knows that I'm successful? Do you think he knows that he missed out that his son that he's all these great kids, but one of them's a fucking star on television right now, and it's the one he chose not to hang out with." Did you ever have those feelings? Because I would have those feelings. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't think so. I think like... Oh my he, God, you're so much better than I am. <laughs> I don't know. I'm certainly not. I just like, for me, it just was always like, because even then, right? Because I was like, it's sort of the silver lining of why I never got too impressed with myself was because like I was famous, but I was fat. So that held me back. That was like, that was kind of like this redundancy or this, it, it was this governor on me saying like well yeah i have this tv show but i'm not comfortable in my body right i'm 300 pounds and i'm 17 so even though like i could go to a party or i could date the cute girl or i could be like the cool you know working actor at this age like i'm just too insecure to embrace it so then i lose all the weight but now i'm just like the kid actor who's like probably going to be a cliche like all data suggests, and I'm not going to do the whackness. I'm not going to make it out and be 35 and been able to stay in the business because for every Zendaya, there's like, you know, a thousand other kids who perpetuate that stereotype. And so I was just never too hot on myself. And then right. So you had a, you had a self-awareness that like th that zero human beings have going into this business but was it awareness or just insecurity by the way i think it's zendaya and i don't want to get crushed in the comments for I that i don't even know who she is either way she's incredible Where, is, who is you she? know who she is she's a star of euphoria 
Bro, she's crushing I've never it. seen Euphoria. Me either, but yeah. I've heard good things. She's in Spider-Man? Oh, yeah. Mary J. Hold on. Dating Tom Holland in real life, and what a couple. Uh, right? Hold on. Right? Pull a picture up of, of... Dude, come on. And she's a Disney yeah, kid. Yeah, I know her. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, what was she in? I saw... I know something she was in. Spider-Man. No, I don't... I never Euphoria. saw Spider-Man. I never saw that either. <laughs> what other things was she in? Space Jam? Dune, Dune. Maybe you know her from Dune. Dune, yeah. Dune no, I haven't seen Dune either. What have <laughs> I either. seen her in? Shake it up. No. no? Keep scrolling. Okay. 21, 24 Jump Street? No. I fucking don't know, but I recognize her, but I don't know what I saw her She's in. She's very famous. Really? I mean, that's probably why you know her. She's just like in the zeitgeist. Like she's around. I yeah, I don't. I've never seen any of these movies. I've never seen any of these movies. <laughs> the Greatest I, Showman? No, keep no? going. I actually have never seen any of these movies. I mean, these are the top scroll, ones. Scroll down. Maybe it's something. What was she a, a child star in? Like, was it Wizards one? of Waverly Place? That was my era, Wizards of Waverly Place. That's what, that's what we watched with Did the you? girls. Yeah. Did That's, your kids watch like Drake and Josh and, and those shows or it was too before their time? I don't know. What, when was Drake and Josh? I mean, it was on from like 2000 to like 2007. But like I say in the book, there's no residuals in kids yeah. TV. So like yeah. they rerun it today. Like it's on right now. They were. No, I don't. I don't know if they were or not, to be honest. But I know what I, I watch with them. Yeah. And one of the things was Wizard of Waverly really Place because Leanne, um, Leanne, uh, wouldn't let made them stop watching it shouldn't like the way the kids talk to their parents right because they're sassy yeah yeah and leanne didn't like that so she pulled the plug on that but no i i don't uh i i i knew jake and i knew of jake and josh just because it's in the i have a buddy who has worked over at nickelodeon steve marmel okay and he did the tv show with the girl that at demi lovato mm -hmm. the, did, that's wizard or no uh yeah i forget her show yeah yeah, yeah. something something yeah but um but yeah and 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 i think i auditioned for stuff like that no during way the time. yeah no, yeah just as like to play the dad or to play the cop or to play the you know whatever was there uh was there a point where where you got so big in your comedy career where you just were like oh i don't have to audition anymore and i'm glad uh no i no <laughs> i think it was the ex it was opposite i think people were like i I think people just stop <laughs> wanting to see me audition. I'm so bad at auditioning. Why? Give me, give me the so stories. I'm so bad. Um, I, <laughs> I, uh, I'm horrible. So I found out when I did, I just did a movie and I found out in doing it that, that I am better. I can only learn lines with blocking. Hmm. So if you block me and you show me where to walk, I can't learn lines and just sit here and tell them to you. Sure. Because I blank out. But if you tell me where to go to say the line or what the motivation of why, like if I'm, I'm very directable. Yes. And so, um, and, and, and auditions, when you just stand and deliver, it's just not my strong suit. And I, and I, I, I misread things. I'm dyslexic too. I will misread things and then I will miss say them in the script and then it will change the meaning entirely. Or I will decide I, I it's the reason I don't reply to people's comments. Yeah. Like people will send a comment to me. And I'll misread it and I'll get angry. Yeah. And then someone will go, that's not what that said. And I'll be like, huh? And then I'm, they're like, wait, keep it up, big guy. And I was like, oh, I thought they were talking about, that's not what they're saying. So I would, and I'd add, I'd, I'd add accents. Like I, I was really bad. I was really bad at auditioning. And so I just uh. stopped auditioning entirely. I was like, I was like, I'm not going to book anything. And I was like, and, I, and so just pull me out of the fucking mix. And I just focused on podcasting and stand up. And that now, I won't I won't audition. I go no, if you, you just want get off. If you, well, yeah, if you want, yeah. I, I actually take that back. I'm not. I'm not really good at. I'm also not really good at at uh, doing a project that I didn't create. Sure. I have a hard time. I have a hard time with like fucking the weirdest things. Like, uh, I can't sit in a trailer and then and then wait for someone. Right. Like, I want. I want to be on set. I want to be watching. I want to be moving around i want to be a part of everything pitching i want to be yeah know, i want to be notes. in the producer's tent i want to be watching everyone's performance i want to right so like i i, I like to to make things but I, i'm not i wouldn't be good to be 
just cast as something. But it's like the catch twenty two of of obviously stand ups now and with podcasting, and then it's totally one hundred percent in your hands. Yeah. But even people like me who would like do the influencing thing and social media and whatnot, like similarly, I've had some really nice success lately in my career doing like you know the show for Hulu, and I'm you know doing this a small part in this Christopher Nolan movie. Like it, it makes no oh, sense. Oh, like the one he's doing right now? Yeah. Oh, my buddy's doing that. But similarly, like where I was doing this show for Disney Plus for the last eight months, and it's like. I'm like sitting on set, literally doing the thing that I was like, this is it. I'm not a cliche. Like I'm not like every other kid's star. Yeah. I've made it. And yet still there's a part of me going like, what am I doing for three hours? I could have knocked out like three TikToks okay. and a YouTube video right uh, now. So I, I got offered a role is uh in a in I got offered a, I got offered a role, straight offer mm. uh in a in a t uh I'm gonna to edit this out because if I put it out there, <laughs> I will get destroyed by the internet. Oh yeah. my god, the internet's gonna bug out. Uh, yeah, so take this out, but I <laughs> I just straight passed. I, d I didn't even read it. For anyone wondering, it it's massive. It's massive. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Try to bleep bleep around, bleep bleep the things. <laughs> and 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 I I just passed, and my wife and my daughters lost their shit. Yeah. And I was like, I just don't really, I I I, I cannot. I don't know. I'm I, I know myself well enough to know that um, to be, like in. A costume sitting in a trailer for a day i start losing my mind going like i have so much shit i could do that yeah. really matters to me not that that wouldn't matter to me but i don't know it's just and my brain doesn't work like that like it's not it's the same way your brain just said i yeah. remember one time i did i did a little thing for uh for this company i was associated with and they wanted me to do uh these mad max uh things like it's like we're just it was like green screen shit yeah and yeah. i was in hair and makeup and i started losing my fucking mind oh yeah i, can't I was like it. i was like i can't i'm not i was like i want to go home like <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm gonna go on the road tomorrow and now i'm just sitting here not being with my kids doing something where i just go ah i'm like can't you get someone else to do this right i got offered i did a i did a voiceover for like one of the nickelodeon things mm -hmm. and i i called them and said can i please give you your money back and i'll give you more money to get someone else to do this because i don't want to do this because it just took too much time it was way too much time and it's not and it wasn't the creativity i enjoy it mm -hmm. wasn't I, my, I wasn't getting to utilize it right so in a weird way i was like i don't know it just wasn't me and you know what's interesting is like and you can't always be it can't always be all about you but like the moments where i've done something where i've had enough i don't know power whatever it is where, or i just didn't care enough where i was like listen if you want me to do this, I know you think this will take three days. You have me for six hours. Like, and I promise you just with like having some knowledge of like how things work. I'm like, this isn't some massive one or with special effects. that's going to require three days. Like this is a back and forth shot. Yeah, yeah. Like I promise you we can get it in six hours and I'll be ready. I won't let you down. I'll yeah. need two takes. See, that's what I, I wish yeah. I could say that. And they've done it. But yeah. but you can't always push to them like that because sometimes they're like, well, if we do that for you, then everyone else gets effed in the process. So, but, but I'll tell you what, where where I where my logic in this fucks up because I, I I'm speaking about the whackness. I would love, I would love to have that your performance. I would love to have that as something I could look back and go, I did that. Yeah. And I'm sure you throughout that whole process. It was a lot of actory shit where you had to sit in a trailer and fucking wait, and you know, oh, yeah. And I, I and and I don't I don't have the bandwidth to do that because like I remember Segura took a fucking role in some Mark, Marky Mark movie, and I was like, I asked him how much it paid, and he told me, and I was like, Why are you doing this? <laughs> right. And he, was, and he was like, For a month, he had to sit in a hotel for a month, and I was like, Taking a cut. I'm not even nothing. <laughs> one podcast read. Yeah. It was he was doing it for one podcast read. In one minute, what he makes in one minute, he was making in one month, and it just didn't make sense. I, I mean, I couldn't wrap my head around it. It's, I mean, like doing something like the whackness, right? Like it was a smaller budget, so you know that you're going to be moving, right? Because they can't, like, time is literally money in that scenario. I'd like doing those. Yeah, you would like, and it's also an indie, so you feel like everyone, no one's there for the money. Yeah, everyone's there because, like, we believe in this script. Let's bootstrap and let's figure this out. I like that. And and then when you're working with someone like, I mean, I, I'm so glad to hear that Ben Kingsley is one of your favorites because he's like my hero, like Sir Ben, dude. And like, I remember the first day of filming with him, it was our third day of filming total. 
And he comes up to me and he goes, you know, this part chose you. Now, I don't know if he says that to everyone he works with. <laughs> but at that moment, I was like, will you be my dad? Like, yeah. thank you. And yeah, and then you're just doing these scenes and it's go and it's moving at a good pace. And you're working off a guy like this where you all of a sudden you're like, wow, I can be good with the right people and good writing and good directing. Like, yeah. cause that's really what it is. You could put you know, you could put Al Pacino in a Lifetime movie. Like, there's just a ceiling on how good it can be. All right, we have changed all our mattresses in our house to Helix mattresses, and I have gotten the best sleep of my life. I did not know I was sleeping on the wrong mattress for so long. We, I told you, we had one mattress in the back room that was, that was, that was like our bed with Leanne was sleep when I was snoring, and she always slept like a dream. We upgraded all our mattresses. Peter slept on one the other night. I literally said to myself, I've been sleeping on the wrong mattress. Here's what I did. I took the two-minute sleep quiz, right? And then it gave me, sent me a mattress. I, as I opened it, I went, that's not what I want. I literally laid it the first night. And I was like, I'm going to have back problems. I woke up the next morning. I felt fucking amazing because Helix knows that everyone's unique. So they have so many different mattresses. I literally took the two-minute sleep quiz. The mattress showed up. I, I have video. We made a video of it because it took me two minutes and five seconds to unbox and place the mattress on the box spring, right? Two minutes and five seconds. The sleep quiz takes two minutes. And I'm telling you right now, this is a huge upgrade for me. I had the best night's sleeps I've ever had before I left to the point where it's like, you ever have something so good, you're like, how do I take this with me? Like, what if I cut it in half and put it in my bunk? And Because I didn't sleep. I slept like shit on the bunk last night. I'm falling asleep. I'm sleeping better. I, I mean, Leanne, when I woke up and it was like, here's what you need to know. Helix is awesome. Though, don't take my word for it. Uh, Helix is awarded the number one best overall mattress pick by 2021 of 2021 by GQ and Wired magazine. Helix has been recommended by multiple leading chiropractors and doctors of sleep medicine as a go-to solution for improving sleep. Just go to helixsleep.com slash Bert, take their two-minute sleep quiz, and they're going to match you with a customized mattress that I am telling you right now, look into my eyes, will give you the best sleep of your entire fucking life. I am telling you right now, I did not know I was sleeping on the wrong mattresses. If you have not taken this sleep quiz, you don't, you don't know how do you sleep. That's the truth. They have a 10-year warranty, and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you're going to love it. I promise you that. Helix even has financing options and flexible payments, so a great sleep, night's sleep is never far away. Helix is offering up to $200 off any mattress order and two free pillows. By the way, their pillows are fucking awesome also. For our listeners at helixsleep.com slash Bert. We had the greatest tushy moment in our family. The girls, uh, we we have one tushy downstairs in our in our bathroom. And the girls always use that, use that. And then Leanne, the one Isla said, I wish I could have that in my bathroom. And Leanne said, You can. And literally did the read, uh all literally was like, Hey, no electrician or plumbing needed. And I was laughing hysterically. The girls, we love Tushy. Look, the, the truth is, if you guys shit on your hands, would you just wipe it off with a piece of paper and be like, that's good for the day? No, you take water to that scenario. Stop spreading your business around your butthole with toilet paper and start washing with Hello Tushy Bidets. Hello Tushy Bidet attachment washes your bum with fresh water for a way better clean than toilet paper. Simply spray and pat dry, attaches to your existing toilet, and Leanne will tell you, no electrician or plumber needed installs in less than eight minutes, and cuts your TPUs by 80%, saving you money and paper waste. Make the restroom your best room with the complete Tushy system. By the way, we also got the ottoman and uh, and toilet brush. Hello Tushy has cleaned over 1 million happy bums. Join them and take care of your business the cleaner way. I want all of our listeners to have a clean bum. Visit hellotushy.com slash to get 10% off plus free shipping right now. Tag us and Hello Tushy on social media so we can celebrate your clean butt with you. That's hellotushy.com slash BurtCast for 10% off. Yeah, I think I would enjoy, I would enjoy bootstraps. I would enjoy more independent stuff. Yeah. Because I like, that's how I, that's what I like. I think the thing I don't like is the larger production where, you know, where where uh, the the one page takes an entire day to shoot. Yeah, they got time to burn. Yeah, I like I like the fucking I like yeah. that. And so yeah, I I wouldn't be 
I wouldn't be opposed to doing stuff like that. I, I, I also like the collaboration. I like that's what I like about this business mm. and, and podcasting and and stand up and doing a special and all the things. I've like the cabin was really fun to shoot. Yeah, yeah. It was fun. It was quick and it moved fast and you felt like you got a lot done in the day. But um, but yeah, but I, I'm still kind of taken aback that you never had those moments. I wonder if I feel. Because I'm fat. But you're an athlete. You have, see, you were an athletic kid. Were you Were you chubby as a kid? No, no. no. Right, so your, ba- your foundation is sound. Like, so now, yeah, sure, you got older and you did the dad move and got a bit of a gut and drank and enjoyed your life, yeah. right? But like, your DNA is in like, no, no, I'm a 16-year-old fucking stud. Yeah, like, but you seem so put together now. Well, it took a lot of work. Like, but what was that? What was like? Talk. To, tell me about the de- the decline and then the rebuilding. Did you lose yeah. weight while doing drugs? No, I lost weight on while I was doing Drake and Josh, like between the third and fourth season, and uh, yeah, between like seventeen to eighteen, I lost like a hundred and ten pounds. Motherfucker. Yeah, like I, I, my biggest swing was I went from three hundred to about to one ninety. And then right around then was when I discovered drugs and alcohol. And then I got down to about 170. And that was what drugs when people started to worry. All of them. Really? Oh, yeah. Total cliche. Really? That guy. Yeah, man. It's like that. What What is Robin? What did Robin Williams say? I was on I was on everything but skates. <laughs> like I was I was fucking lit. I was that kid. It was bad. And did your mom know? Did she have an idea? Not right away. She'd just be like, why does it smell like skunk in your room? And I'd be <laughs> like, He's, there's a lot of wild animals in North Hollywood. That's why. <laughs> so this whole time you're still living with your mom. I was living in my, with my mom until I was 19. And then me living with my mom was getting in the way of my drug habit. So I was like, Ma, I'm going to get you an apartment in New York. And you're going to go back home and live in our old neighborhood. And it's going to be great. And she was like, great. Like, I've always, you know, imagined I'd go home. I've been out here six years, but I lived my whole life on the East Coast. And six months into her living there, she came home or she came to L.A. to visit. And she was like, I'm not leaving. You're a fucking mess. Really? Yeah. So because that's in you and your mom have such a close relationship. You guys lived in hell's kitchen together Mm -hmm. in like a a studio or or one bedroom yeah like a 500 square foot apartment and that is crazy because i bet people hearing this would be like whoa 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 like your mom lives on the couch you had the bedroom right we would switch so like we we lived in a studio for a while because we when we really didn't have any dough and so we would there was a murphy bed and then there was a couch and we would sort of like switch off every other night and then eventually we got a little bit of money, but still it was New York. I, I remember that 500 square foot apartment that I love that was like right by my school. And it just was like this new beginning for us. It cost 2,900 a month for 500 square feet in 99. Yeah. Yeah. That tracks. I had a thousand square foot apartment and I want to say it was like at a thousand square foot apartment in the village, I think. I think I don't know how big it was, but I think our that's that's pretty big in New York. Yeah. Right? It's a two bedroom. Yeah, and it was uh, we had we had yeah I gotta forget I think it was three thousand a month or four thousand a month. Yeah, I don't I, I don't remember my memory is fucking shit. <laughs> the and so then so when we moved out here and we moved into an Avalon apartment complex in North Hollywood. I'm like, you know, and and granted, it's a bit of a misnomer, but people are like, you were on Drake and Josh at the height of that. What was that like? I was like, I lived at the Avalon in a two bedroom apartment that was nineteen hundred a month that had a full gym, a pool and a racquetball court. And we thought we were crushing it. Really? Like, but that was the height of my life. I was like, oh, no, they we have a security guard like I'm I'm crushing it. Six, uh, six seasons, four seasons. We did four seasons, 60 episodes. Yeah. And then what? I'm trying to figure out what your what your price point was probably at back then. Make how much I made on the show? Yeah. Uh, you don't have to say. I said it in the book. Oh yeah, maybe I maybe I did see that. Uh 15? We we're making 15 an app. Yeah. Yeah. Which obviously, I mean, you have to people give but people the caveat. Think, people think you're millionaires. Right. They think like I made 900,000 bucks off of, you know, four seasons 60 episodes, but 
we made half of that because of taxes and agent manager. And so over four years, five years, it was about a hundred grand a year. Now, granted, people who've read the book have tweeted at me like, you asshole, like I work with kids and I make 50 grand a year. And I'm not here to get in an argument like you deserve way more money if you work with kids and make that. I just like comparatively. And I think what the public perception was, it was like, yeah, it was like a nice middle class living, but you certainly wasn't you weren't set for life. By no, no, no. Like, that's the that's the problem is like people see you on TV and think, oh, they're rich. I yeah. remember when I was on Travel Channel, I was making less than you were making on Josh and Drake. Oh, I, I bet. I think. And uh, I'm certain of it. And uh, at times money fluctuated with that. It was a weird it's a weird kind of deal in that the harder I worked, I could get bonuses. So oh, like, really? Yeah. The deal was structured so that like I I really don't know what we were getting per episode, but like, if you if, bungee jumped, no, 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 no. If if they, my contract was for a certain amount of things. Uh. If they used me over that, then they paid penalties on my contract. So then I got time and a half or two two times my pay. Nice. So if they if they said we signed you for thirteen episodes this year, and I did twenty six episodes, well then those other thirteen that was where I made some money. So I and so adversely, I would want to work more, and I right. want to be away ho from home more because I would get more money. Did you have any overlap with Bourdain during that time? On uh, Travel never Channel? met. Never met him. Man, we we were at the network at the same time for like a second, right? Uh, but never met him. The man. Uh, yeah. The dude. Yeah, he was. He, he was the reason that you know when we when I got on Travel Channel, the reason I went on was Adam Richmond, which by the way, you have no idea. How much you remind me of Adam Richmond. We're very similar humans. Very similar humans. East Coast Jews, thick boys. And bo both both adorable kids. <laughs> he was an adorable kid, and you both very close with your moms. Yeah. Um, do you know him at all? I know him a little bit through Vine and, and yeah. stuff like that. Because he, he used to be uh he had he had a big following on Vine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was uh but um him and bourdain the only reason i took the meeting for birth conqueror is because adam richmond's the people that produced man versus food were producing birth conqueror and the only reason i wanted to go to travel channel was to talk about bourdain i've heard uh, you know whenever i've done like um met on reality shows or not reality shows but shows like that where yeah. it's got somewhat of like a celebrity host or whatever they say specifically don't bring up bourdain in your meeting at all because no one is bourdain and every asshole thinks, well, I like food and I like traveling. And well, they, that was the the thing was everyone was trying to do Bourdain because it looks like the best job on earth. Yeah, and and no one could do Bourdain because number one, and, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, anyone could have done what he did, meaning going around and having some meals. Sure. The difference was he wrote all his copy for right. voiceover. He wrote it himself. He's a brilliant writer, and he was a brilliant writer. And he had an authenticity to him that didn't need him to perform. Right. So he didn't mind sitting in the cut and, and letting a moment breathe. And he also ran 0.0, .0 I think, did his production. But his production was his production. When he went out on the road, he produced that. And I was told this by Travel Channel. They're like, you need to do what Anthony Bourdain does. And you need to be in control of everything. Yeah, You need to, I mean... It, I mean, it was very problematic when they do. The guy told that to me, and then he quit Travel Channel. He was like, he right. was like I'm going to give you the tool. I'm going to give you the keys to start the car. I'm going to show you how to run into a wall. Take care. And he bounced. And um, But uh, but Bourdain ran, ran that show. That was his show, meaning he made that for television every week. He made that. Right. And, so, and not everyone can do that. And I was told specifically a number of times you are not anthony bourdain <laughs> right. a number of times i've never yeah. remember one time right before i got fired i got told that a lot <laughs> but he was just he was just he was a different type of dude you think about how many he changed the landscape of there was a period of time where i was like i guess i should have gone to culinary school to get on television right because only chefs were on television he there's this in in his doc he's kind of having his first meeting with the girl that he dated in the end asia argento and and they're talking about the stress she seems like a cunt <laughs> I, I mean i i'm not she seems like a real cunt <laughs> but they're i mean they're at this restaurant and she's like it's like her favorite restaurant in in italy and she's about to say the name he's like don't say the name and she's like why and he's like do you want to ruin this place 
I have a problem with that, though. <laughs> Tell me. And here's my problem. So, like, so because I have a friend who he's like, I won't say his name, but he's like, he's like, you know what, dude? Like, <laughs> Bill Burr said to me one time, he was telling me about a pizza place mm. in Boston that he loves. I said, what's the name of it? He goes, I'm not saying on this because then I'll ruin it. But you're not ruining it for the guy that makes pizzas. You're making his life better. Sure. That guy makes great pizzas. Not, not, he didn't, doesn't make them specifically for Bill Burr to get to enjoy. Sure. He makes them for fucking everyone. And so like, as a guy that, that it's like, it's like, can you imagine if someone's like, uh, who's your favorite comic? You're like, I don't want to tell you. So I, I don't want to, I don't want him to get successful. I don't want to change ruin him. It. Yeah. It's like, fuck off. Tell everyone. <laughs> yeah. Word of mouth kills it. I understand that Anthony Bourdain once he said the name of a place, it would become you. You would no longer be able to get a table there, right? Because that's his thing. But the word of mouth, I, I've never understood that. Of like, I don't want to, I don't want to ruin. It's, it won't be cool anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's too public. I mean, I guess they're. Um, no, look, money's always good. More business is always good. If you're running a business, you want the best thing you can do is help that business out. Right. That's my, that's the way my brain works. Are, do you, I'm fascinated, like, because, like, what you just, you know, being able to, like, call someone the C-word on your podcast and, like, have no reservation about it. Are, do, is that, like, a good that feeling? Was a, that was a great pun. <laughs> I called Anthony Bourdain's ex-girlfriend a cunt, and I had no reservations. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Magic. But, like, you're at this place where you're like, yeah, I don't have to worry about it. Like, well, I don't have to worry about Asia Argentum. <laughs> I'm fucking that woman will never cross paths with me i will have no i think she molested a child so like i don't i really have no i have no reservations Zero. about calling her a cunt at all and and by the way i it's like i don't know I don't, but how free like you seem pretty free in a, in a great oh, way i'm not i'm not no no you're, i'm not I, there's careful. things like like also it's like and i hope i that I, but like like i don't have a lot of room for your ex your ex co-star sure i don't have a lot of i i, I do i don't know what happened with him or didn't happen with him, but I don't have a lot of fucking wiggle space in that territory for how I feel about those things. Yes. And, and, and I understand that I, that I understand that, that I don't know all the things and that kid that I won't say his name, but that kid may be like, dude, you don't know what fucking happened. And I get that. I totally get that. But I also like, yeah, I, I it's also, upsetting. I, it's, it's like, it's like certain things, they don't get flagged by people if you know I don't, yeah. it just doesn't happen that way i i don't know maybe i'm wrong but like so i don't have a problem so like i bite my tongue about that because i don't know all the things sure but like i didn't like asia or Jenim. and I, because i was a fan of anthony bourdain she he dated her he killed himself i i just was like i'm fuck her i don't really give a shit about her you yeah know? no i mean it's I think there's like, but it's also when you're as self-made as you are and people like, especially like, and standups are rare in that way, right? Because it's, it's literally like, so if the industry tomorrow was like, you're done for whatever reason, like, mm -hmm. well, my Patreon's not done, like putting out a special and giving it right to my audience isn't done. Like you're, it's, you're slightly uncancelable. No, that's not true. No, I'm very cancelable. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But like not. But not for okay. ridiculous reasons, well, no, right? So, okay, so like, like ultra okay. PC reasons. So whatever. like, I'm I'm cancelable, but I, you know, but, but if I if I do so, I, I'm sure I'm cancelable, right? If you do something worth canceling over, something yeah. that's like, but like I'm a little oblivious to certain things. Like I am oblivious to certain things. Where like, um, I I really am oblivious to the fact that if I say something, like the jimmy carr stuff going on with jimmy carr you know how jimmy carr made a joke about the holocaust and and recently yeah yeah okay and I, i'm i'm shocked that so many people are trying to cancel him because i was like he's he was at he was on a stage holding a microphone mm. and you are aware that the pre, that everything said into that microphone was intended to be a joke right like where where's the I can't have a lot of respect for the people that don't understand that what he's trying to do is get you to laugh. And I, like, I, it's, it's a yeah. joke. And that's what Jimmy does. Jimmy does that better than anyone. Those horrible jokes, horrible yeah. jokes. But like, I can't understand. I, like, so I'm oblivious to that. I'm, I'm very oblivious to like, I figure whatever I say on stage and I've said horrible things on stage, but I assume people understand the intent was to get them to laugh. 
Sure. Like that, that everything was always intended to get them to laugh. And that part of my job is to take chances. I had a joke. I have a joke uh, about uh, Confederate statues that I uh, that I worked out over the cor- over over the quarantine when I was working it out on at drive-in movie theaters and some clubs, hmm. and it was extremely racist. <laughs> yeah, and and I couldn't, but I knew that. In, I knew the joke I was trying to make wasn't. I just didn't know. I had to. You got to figure it out. You got to find where the line is. I got. I just got to figure out. Well. Yeah, it's it's like I I want I, you had to figure you have to figure the joke out. That's how jokes work. Is he, they're not all yeah. perfect. They're 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 malleable, and then you you got to work them. And is it a bit of a call and response for the audience when you're introducing a new bit, where you're kind of like, is it here, guys? And then you hear kind of like half laughs, half groans, and you go, okay, gotcha. Like need to dial like half of this in. Like it's yeah. really that's what the trying out period is for a joke, right? Yeah, and it's, and you know. And yeah, that's, I mean, I'm sure that's cancelable. So that's, that's where I think I'm oblivious to that. Cause I just go, everyone knows I'm trying to make a fucking joke. And I'm right. like, I d- d- called my wife a whore the other night on stage <laughs> and, and it got a laugh and I was like, oh, I got to run that buyer definitely before I put it in the special, but sure. But, and then I go, well, man, I wonder if they got a laugh or it got like a, whoa, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. So yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm hyper aware of like things I say now more i was i mean we were like when podcasting started it was the wild wild west yeah i mean it was like i mean i did i did rogan's recently i did five and a half hours and they pulled it down and had to edit something i said out of it i think really i don't know i just i closed my eyes i put my head down i just started walking that day i was like (laughs) just pray i guess i might have said that united states government created covid maybe (laughs) maybe i said it i don't know do you start thinking about i mean now you're in a place where like okay if it all ends tomorrow you're just like all right so what what am i no but like do you ever like i'm not there (laughs) but i mean it's like (laughs) i'd be like that really sucks i thought it was gonna go longer (laughs) no totally save here but like i start thinking about like okay my best friend works in trucking and he's got a pretty high like he can no, he can no, employ I, guys. No, I get to that. I what are you talking about? That. <laughs> I, can't I start going I was, like, all right. I'm I gonna... go into a separate entrance at the airport. He's telling me <laughs> I gotta go back into fucking coach. Southwest, maybe you can do the business seats. You know where you get the arrows. No, I would. No, I don't know. I, I start okay, thinking I fantasi- about. I fantasized that. about it. I fantasized about it. Um. Yeah, I, I've thought about it. I've thought about. I could probably. Um, I, I, I can't, I couldn't not work in entertainment. Mm. So you'd want to, even if, cause to me that would be harder, right? Like I got pushed out of what I really want to do. So mm. now I'm going to work like as a creative exec. Like no, 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 I, no, I'd have no. to turn my back on it. Almost. No, I would. Cause my, my thing is, so I, my thing is less, it's so funny. My fear is not, um, getting canceled although i mean i I think about it just i'm sure it's the same way everyone else does um but that's not really at the front my big thing is um death and and so like that's i I think about because it's like you may or may not get canceled you're definitely gonna die yeah like that's where my like if we're talking about or my other thing is like what if i have a stroke and i and i lose the Mm. my face and the left side of my body and then people and then worse yeah it's and then you can't you can't do stand up anymore because people can't watch you, you know, or like, or like, what if I get burned really bad? Like those, those are, those are the things I really think about. Wow. And so fatalistic. And, yeah. yeah. And, and so then I would, I would try to think, well, what could I do? Maybe I could do radio. I couldn't do a podcast because video components are so heavy. Maybe I could do talk radio and get a nice like lump sum. You know, I don't know. I, I, I think about that sometimes. I think about moving back to Florida right but i we, couldn't i don't know if i could sell cars well because you're you're still that guy from that thing like and that's the part i i see that in the book too it's like no one walks away from showbiz on their own accord like no one really walks unless you're so cool. big that would be cool though yeah i mean like steve martin is awesome at the banjo because he's fucking steve martin <laughs> and he was like yeah. i crushed it so hard i guess the banjo will be my next frontier but for most of us, it's that you're, and you watch these people who like do 
a bad reality show after bad reality show. And you're like, but they had such a moment. They were so dope. And now this, and it's like, well, yeah, because their ego won't allow them to be like the best real estate agent in Dallas. But what, but what about this? Because as you said that, I thought, like I'm at I'm at a, I'm at a a, a a hustle clip right now where mm. it's 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 uh, cannibalizing itself. Like I'm I'm fucking burning it at both ends yeah. consistently. Touring, I'm putting on this new fe comedy festival that I'm launching. Um, I have a movie. We have another movie. We have two other movies that we're working on. All this, and then I go. I wonder if there's a solace in like, in just getting on like uh whatever game night is on tbs or you know or yeah. like uh like just and being that celebrity that goes yeah 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 yeah, get me on dancing with the stars yeah like just maybe there's a solace in that where you go yeah i'm just famous for famous sake and i just pay the bills by doing whatever the fuck and i don't really give a fuck like I, maybe yeah. i like reading so i like sitting in a trailer and reading you know like yeah. if i like my problem is i'm stupid so if i sit in a trailer i just sit there and go like and i'm like come on what are we gonna do you know like yeah maybe the there is a like a, a real coolness in being i don't know i i, I really uh i really thought about chelsea handler a lot at a series it seemed like she just didn't walk away from the business but she walked away from like touring right. and took a break and i was like that would be cool as fuck yeah to like legit take a break and be like how much money do you think you need to to do that and and could you do that <sighs> it did the money thing i always think about like what are you gonna if you like are in good investments what's your nut like what are you gonna live off of so if you got you got 20 mil in the bank you're getting like seven percent interest you're getting 1.2 mil a year i mean that's a nice life and you're not yeah, touching principal yeah but you not need that i've thought about this <laughs> you're not touching principal. i mean that to me i'm like that's the goal that's where you want to get i mean maybe you're not going to the private room at the airport but you live in nice your yeah. kids can go to well, nice well, i don't need by the way if i didn't fly every fucking week totally i wouldn't need it if but if i flew once every blue moon right you know like the way a regular person lives where they go yeah i'll go i'll fly to go on vacation yeah like <laughs> i listened to a dude go uh, on the plane next to me yesterday yesterday yeah yesterday and he was like he's on the phone with his wife and he was like honey I just don't know if it's worth it, you know, uh, traveling once a month. Uh, it, you know, it takes its toll. And I went once a month. Wow. I want to be like, listen, bitch. <laughs> yeah. yeah live, live in my fucking life. I got off stage at fucking midnight. I went over to the bar at Penn State, hung out, did pictures until two in the morning, got on a bus, drove to D.C., had four hours sleep on a road to D.C. from fucking Penn State. Right. And fucking it got on a plane. I'm going home. I'm but I'm working. I got one week off, and then I'm back on for another month, and then and I'm like, I just look at it like, if I could be that guy, I wouldn't need any the private suite, any of the the, the fly private ever ever. I could just right. go on a trip with your family to vacation. How fun would that be? Go to the yeah. airport, and the airport's fun. You're like enjoy the airport. You're like ooh, mm, Panera. Th let's get a Cinnabon. Yeah, like I would love that. Oh, Hudson News. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my vacations aren't vacations. They're like literally a time for me to decompress and go like i don't like everyone else gets ready for their vacation i don't need, i don't think i vacation the same way everyone else gets to vacation do you have hobbies no no me either fuck people me. like us don't have hobbies. yeah what's fuck my hobbies hobbies i had a therapist tell me i needed a hobby one time and i go i write jokes <laughs> yeah yeah i obsess i <laughs> that's so funny to hear someone go i was like i took up uh i the therapist made me get one hobby, and so I took up leather making. Leather, of course. And sure. I made one fanny pack, and then as I'm making a fanny <laughs> for pack for Joe Rogan, yeah. <laughs> no, for one, as I'm making it, I go, I could sell this at my shows. That's so awesome. I wonder what I wonder what the markup could be. So much. Yeah. So wait. Handmade so then, what is your day? What is a day, what does a day in your life look like? Um, I your mean, kids how old? Um, three. So, so fun. It's so fun. I so I drive him to school every morning. And then in a normal day, it's like literally, I mean, I'm really big on like going to, like I still go to acting class every week because I stay, I just want to stay ready. I want to stay primed for whatever's coming next. And my biggest thing is that imposter syndrome. It's so funny. I would never, I don't never, I could not sit in an acting class to save my fucking life. You might like it. I do it over Zoom. So it's like a whole other level now because 
out of COVID, my teacher started doing it on Zoom. And she's like, you know, I'm coaching mo most people for TV and movies. And instead of being like in a black box theater and you're 15 feet away from me, I can kind of see you like right here on the screen. It's it's kind of better. Yeah. And so, yeah, so I'll do that. But I have my podcast, Male Models, that I'll do. And then it's like really, it's social media because I'm like, this is going to sustain me so that I don't have to take some job that I'm going to hate that just because it came around or, or yeah, I mean, it's the social media for years was like this blessing and a curse. Cause my ego hated this idea that like I had started in traditional and it seemed like I was no longer relevant in that space. And now that I've been lucky enough to have both worlds, I'm so, I feel so lucky to have this thing. Cause I have friends who are like actors whose careers I'm, I'm jealous of like journeyman actors who, even like, you know, I uh, like I like my buddy I'm working with right now, like Michael Angarano, who's like, you know, you might not know his name right away, but he's been in so many good I things. Pull him up. Let me see him. He's worked with Soderbergh and um, check him out. He's totally crushing. A-N-G. Angarano. No, not E-N-G. A-N-G. So. Yeah, go, yeah, there yeah, you yeah, go, yeah. There you go. But he's he's crushed it been in so many good things and uh i'm trying to think of what like did you ever watch that show the nick or that movie hey who is he in who is he in almost famous he was young the young patrick fugate character wait what do you mean the one who's like, patrick Fug oh, he's the lead so he was like yeah. the the he was the kid version of him because you know like they do flashbacks when he's a kid yeah with francis mcdormand yeah wait yeah. wait was, wasn't the whole movie in a flashback uh-uh I, I fucking <laughs> I'm I'm the worst. You just I'm got a fucking you worst. You just got back from drinking at Penn State. Oh, he's that kid? Yeah, but he's where I mean he's he literally like crushes it. And I have like a lot of friends. My buddy Brian Garrity, who was in uh Flight and Boardwalk Empire and all these things, like they've worked like they have careers I'm jealous of. God, they're man, this guy really fucking acts. Yeah, dude. But this is what happens. Like, there's a lot of these guys who are like these journeyman guys who just do good show after good show. But again, you're still slightly at the mercy of like, I got to get that next gig. Someone's got to be like, you're the one. And for but me, you're, but you're uh, that, that's really bothers me. Cause like, I, I actually am putting no work into my acting career and I'm watching you. And I think you're fucking awesome. Oh, and thanks. I was like, Oh, you're so you're like, I feel like, I feel like, I feel like T I where T I was like, I'm going to stand up. I'm yeah. gonna do stand up and you're like not like, just stand up let's be honest 45 minutes in a fucking <laughs> arena stop an arena he got booed he got booed off stage and, <laughs> oh fuck yeah but it's I'm like I, I, part of me goes I wish I had that confidence that he has where he's like I'm ready to start headlining and I'm like cause I've I've been doing it a very long time and I'm I, I, I and then I watched his set and there's I was like I was like not the best well it's 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 observational comedy, which is odd. Sure. He's it's like, like some Seinfeld shit. Yeah, he's well, like what's the deal? No, he's like he was like, You don't want to you don't want to date a girl who knows the I, I mean the premise was kind of off, but he was like talking about uh I'm not I'm not shitting on TI by the way. I, I like no, TI. No, TI's the man. I like TI and I'd like to see him blah. I think there's a lot of uh rappers that would be great stand ups. Method man, red man, killer mike. Uh, there's a lot of uh rappers i would love to see do comedy hmm. and i'd love to see ti do comedy i would love to watch him do comedy i would also love to sit with him and tell him where he's where his holes in his game are yeah and i and i but it's interesting that i don't think ti believes i am from what i've heard it doesn't sound like he really believes that i would have any insight to give him hmm. you know like it sounds like he's, he's like, pretty I'm much set. I, I pretty much got it right. like i'm good i'm ti Right. And you're like, yeah. you're, and you're like, you can't deny it. He is Di. True. He's well. I mean, pound for pound, one, one of the best rappers in the game. With, with yes, I, I would put him up against his verses against a lot of fucking people, and they go head to head. Ti is prolific. He's certified famous. Sir, and he's, and he's by the way, one of the most charismatic. I guarantee you. He could talk my pants off me in an Escalade very quickly. And I'd be like, how the fuck did I get naked? Or a Denali. Or a Denali. <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's a better purchase, in my opinion. A high-end SUV. <laughs> but um, but I would love to watch him work. I would love Killer Mike to do stand-up. Do, yeah. do, you, do you like hip-hop? 
Yeah, oh yeah. I'm yeah. I'm a crazy fan. But Killer Mike is already like who says that I think Marion always talks about how like Kinnison was sort of like um he came from like he was the son of a preacher or like how <laughs> Kinnison sort of pentameter the way he spoke was like that of like a, a a revival preacher, like a tent guy. Yeah. And how like every comedian's kind of a uh a reverend and every reverend's kind of a comedian. Right. And I think of killer Mike that way too. I mean, you hear him on Bill Maher. I mean, he's talking about these like weighty subjects and yet he's like able to have this sort of levity to it, which is, I feel like would serve him great in stand up. One of the things that um, like, there's a, I love comedians. There's a comedian, Brian Simpson. And he has such a brilliant insight. And I think that's what I I'm excited about when I hear TI or, comedian rappers getting because what ti has is a brilliant insight into life like mm -hmm. meaning he's just very he's a very smart dude the way he sees things is off to the left I and mean, this guy brian simpson who's fucking hilarious he is he was on the podcast and he said things where i was just like what the fuck like his insight yeah. that's why when that's why your insight about <clears throat> having to mourn someone that you didn't know yeah it was so fuck it I, like it just it's a, one of those things that i take a step back and go oh i don't think that deep about things sometimes mm -hmm. i just feel them and then we'll go through them and then i'm like oh my you know i'm not the most introspective person at times i couldn't be like the with my dad right <laughs> after he died i went my dad was in his 80s when he died so he didn't have much of an online footprint and i'd never seen even a photo do you so, look like him well yeah i'll show you a photo i really? mean it's wild yeah because i found pictures of him I wound up looking up my siblings because I knew their names and they had Facebooks. And so then in finding their profile, suddenly it was like this treasure trove was unleashed of him at bar mitzvahs and weddings and throughout his whole life. And these tributes to him after he passed, like of what a great dad he was and how much his kids loved him. And I realized like I couldn't be the arbiter of the ultimate right. Like what he was to me wasn't the only part of him because he seemed to also be this great dad just to them like what i needed him to be for me wow he was for them and the when we were talking about Koppelman before and i said i don't i don't want to blow up their image of what they have of their father and Koppelman said yeah but don't you think that maybe his daughter or somebody has a suspicion that like dad would come home some nights with like a look in his eye or come home smelling like pickles because my mom and him went out for deli after they fucked <laughs> like <laughs> shout out mom um, <laughs> but like and that you would almost be like giving them some sort of like insight or re almost like relief no <laughs> yeah I, I'm on the, no. I agree with you so here's here's my take so my my uh, two sides so my my i i I don't want to know more about my dad than I know now. Mm. It's perfect. Leave it at be. Yeah. Like if my dad dies tomorrow, I do not want to know that he had another family. I don't want to like that would I would that would tarnish the way I saw my relationship with my dad. Now, it's it's but that, well, it's interesting that you chose to just kind of not be the grenade. Yeah. And I was just, and in having to mourn him, it was when he died, like that grenade got taken away and I was pissed. I was like, oh, I can't, I don't have this power over him anymore. Cause he exited. Like he, he finished with a clean slate, at least for him. Did, did, uh, did, how did your mom talk about him? She was lovely about him. My mom, I, I have to give her credit for a lot of things. This especially till I was like 15, all I knew of my dad was he was just like, handsome uh great sort of business person schmoozer charming guy who just like the only caveat wa was he wanted nothing to do with me but otherwise <laughs> the only thing great great this guy dude. is top notch does not want to speak to you yeah. but does not fuck with you <laughs> but otherwise the best you know like a jewish james bond walking on park avenue in like a brooks brothers suit and then as i got older she kind of like slowly was like well Yes, he was those things until I got pregnant. And then, like, I, I tell the story in the book that she she was like, I'm I'm pregnant and it's yours. And he goes, no, no, it's not. And she goes, trust me, it is. And so she went and got a paternity test with her doctor. And he was like, this is fake. Your doctor's on the take. Like, this is a friend of yours. I want you to go to my doctor. And so she did. 
And my mom says, I showed up. I saw the doctor. I see the doctor go and make a call. And then the nurse comes out to me and says, you can go. Because she's like, I assume that the fact that I was there and calling his bluff, that the doctor was like, she's here. She's not afraid. And he was like, and then he never spoke to her again until like I was 10 months old and she took him to court and he kind of like, they didn't did even. He, did they, yeah, did he give you her money? They didn't even, he didn't want it on the books. So he basically like, my mom's best friend was her lawyer who like happened to be a lawyer, but not in family law. Like, and basically he took the lawyer aside and was like, if I give you, I think at that time, like, I, I don't even know what it was. It wasn't a lot of money, but it was probably like between 50 and a hundred grand, like to just go away. And, and that was it. She took it and was like, cause I'm not going to, she's like, I'm not going to chase this guy for the next 18 years. Um, and he exited. That was the last time. Wow. Dude. That's, 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 that's so heavy to me. Cause it, it does end up defining someone without it meaning to, like it mm -hmm. does put a thumbprint on you of, of that you don't, that maybe you don't know or didn't like, you don't know it's there, you know? Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's interesting. Like, uh, my, one of our friends grew up without it, without a dad, black dude grew up without a dad, but it's interesting. The things I see in him that I, I know, Oh, okay, I think that's that's because you didn't know your dad. Like what? Uh, I can't. Well, just like reactions or interpersonal uh, physicality. Hmm. Like f very like because I think because there was a man in the house. I like for me. uncross my legs. No, 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 no. Like, like, more like he's dude. willing to get physical. He's willing to fight. <laughs> right. And I'm like, I'm like, I wonder if that's because I want. I just always wonder, like, because I'm not, I'm not willing to fight. But I, I remember. There was an there was an alpha in my house that would right. put me in my place if I and then I, I you know I don't know but it's it's fascinating to me and your insight about it is fucking insane. We certainly have to be our like we're these weird partners to our to there's like it's not incestuous but we are like we're the man of our house and even and we tend to have these incredibly like domineering strong mothers like I joke like my mom used to like if I fuck with my mom like she would talk to me like I cut her off in traffic. Cause like she had to be both parents. She never hit me, but she yeah. would be like, she would have no problem cursing me out. Cause it was like, what else was she going to do? But then, but I was also her protector. And I started to walk around with like this chip on my shoulder, which was like, don't talk to me. Like I am my age, not realizing that the world doesn't know my story. They don't know that I'm the man in my house. They just know. No, nah, you're a 13 year old. snot nosed kid. Like I'm going to talk to you like a kid. And I'm like, Right, but I'm also the man of my house, so I'm gonna require an extra level of respect. Wow! And I and like my wife will have to tell me to this day at 35, like they're not disrespecting you, Josh. They're just in their own world. And I'm like, well, I might have to write this injustice. <laughs> and she's like, good fucking luck, you idiot. So wait, so how did you lose the weight? I just, it's boring. I started eating better and working out more, but I had no foundation. So like I had to lose, I lost 60 pounds. You said your mom, I, I, your, your mom would fluctuate in weight. Yeah. My mom had like her issues throughout my whole life going to, you know, Weight Watchers meetings and these things. So I knew I was like, oh, food is a menacing force to the pecs. Like it's, if I don't figure this out now, I might never. And I knew my mom well into her forties and fifties was still working on it. Um, and so I, had to, I lost 60 pounds and I went into the gym, shout out my first trainer, Ronaldo. And he was like, we're going to do a push up." And I was like, good one. I cannot do a push up." And he's like, well, then we'll do it from your knees. I said, even better one. I can't even do one from my knees. Really? And he's like, okay, well, you're going to do it from your knees and I'm going to get a towel and wrap it around your waist. And I'm going to like anchor you and take some extra weight off your arms. And you're just going to do as At this many time as you you're can. like 240? 240 yeah but just know you know most guys who get heavy in their 20s and 30s they have a great foundation so they're still reasonably athletic just limited by their size but i had no foundation oh you had no foundation so you had never oh yeah 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 you'd yeah. never benched like every i like every guy i knew by freshman year you you were mandatory could bench 135 10 times right like that's every dude i grew up with 135 was like that's 240 that's 45s on each side right and to this day and then by the time you were a, a senior you could do 225 once everyone could do 225 once that was 
two forty fives. This was when I tried to do two twenty five three times. <laughs> what happened? I what the fuck happened? <laughs> I, I, Josh Peck popped his peck. Are you serious? That yeah, can happen? Dude. Oh yeah, it ripped off here and shot into my breast. Yeah, bench pressing two fifteen for three. Not to brag. Holy Ouch. shit! Yeah, that's rough. I heard a towel rip, and I said that was inside me. <laughs> and then, and I never, I'd heard of like rotator cuff. I can't, or I can't, knee. I didn't, I can't, I, my, my, my arms are <laughs> well, What about this? What about, uh, I got a couple. What about, have you uh, heard of compartment syndrome? No. I had double compartment syndrome in both my legs. What's compartment syndrome? It's where the compartments that your muscles live in begin to fill with blood and your muscle becomes strangulated and they have to do a double fasciotomy, which is cut your leg open and allow your muscle to come back to life. Otherwise, you won't be able to walk anymore. How did that happen? I got a tummy tuck at 21 years old because I'd lost 120 pounds. And it's the sad reality that your skin doesn't quite snap back. And it turned into like this nine hour surgery. And basically, when I woke up, I go, I'm in pain. Like my legs, my legs. The number one sign of compartment syndrome, which is a crazy emergency thing that can happen, is a pain so deep that even morphine can't treat it. So I woke up and I'm like, ah, my legs, my legs. And they were like, ah, you're fine. You know, you're just like not used to surgery. So they have me go home for 24 hours. And every hour I'm like screaming out in pain. I'm like, I'm in pain. This is bad. This is bad. Finally, they come and take my blood and they realize that I'm like bleeding out. Like this is bad news bears. And I wake up and I'm in the arms of the Santa Monica fire department. And they're like, we're here to take you to the hospital. Like, you're in trouble. And I go, let's go. Lights and sirens, boys. And I show up and I get to the ER at St. Joseph's Hospital or St. John's Hospital in Santa Monica. Shout out. And the ER doctor goes, you look like the guy from Entourage. And I go, Turtle or Vince? <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and he was like, don't worry, we're going to take care of you. Because I had been bleeding out from a different part of like the surgery, right? Around my abdomen. It was totally unrelated. But it was like God or the universe being like, we got to get you in now. Because this wasn't a big deal. But the legs were a really big deal. And this doctor walks in. And he goes, we're going to take care of your stomach. I know where you're bleeding. That's fine. But what's wrong with your legs? And I said, I I'm, I'm dying. I'm, I'm dying. And he looks and they're rock hard. He takes out this needle that's like this long with a box on the end. It's a pressure gauge. He puts it into my leg. And the pressure should be like somewhere in like the low teens. The pressure is 35. And I just hear him go, prep for emergency surgery. And my mom falls apart. And it's the only time I've ever seen it. And she goes, well, well, he just had surgery an hour ago. He can't have, or a day ago, he can't have surgery again. And, and the doctor goes, oh, he's having surgery. And she goes, no, 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 but if it was your kid, what would you do? And he goes, I'd already have him in surgery. And that was it. And another 10 hour surgery of having both legs cut open. 10 hour surgery. <laughs> yeah. And then I had to stay in the hospital for three days with my legs open. Like they left them open. Cause they were like, <laughs> they were like, we went in and looked at the muscle and because it, you didn't come in for over a day, the muscle looks kind of dead. And if it stays dead, we have to cut it out because we can't leave that in your body. And if that happens, you're going to have a crazy limp for the rest of your life. And three days later they went back in and somehow my body had started to like put blood vessels through it. Like it started to sort of, it would never be 100%, but it would get good enough where they didn't have to remove it. They closed me up, and I was in the hyperbaric chamber that night in this, like, totally industrial, drop you 35 feet, like, below uh, sea level pressure, 100%, like, pure oxygen. And I did that every day for the next, like, three months. That's so good for you, too. Dude, it saved me. And also, they gave me a Valium when I went in there. And I was two months sober, but I was allowed to take the Valium and the pain medicine. So I was like, guys, let's roll. Love the hyperbaric chamber. Wait, they give you a Valium to go in? <laughs> yeah, dude, because you're in a glass tube. And oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know. Oh, yeah. I know. I'm hyper aware. <laughs> I can... Have you done a lot of the hyper? No, I fucking... I've... <laughs> I got When I got surgery, Gabby Reese called me up and was she's like... She's the best. Isn't she the best? She's the best. I... She's the best. Her husband's a fucking the. Uh, he is the 
the prototype of what every man should strive to be the king yeah and and but she called me up and she goes uh hey you need to get in the hyperbaric chamber and i was like all right and i was like where do i find one she's like i talked to rogan rogan will know so i called joe and joe's like oh yeah yeah i've been doing you know fucking i, I, I yeah man i yeah, man. sleep in them i sleep in them or whatever <laughs> yeah. and he's like and uh, he's like yeah i'll set you up with a place and so then i google the place and then i'm like cool and and then i was like well, maybe i should find out what this is and i see it's just a glass tube and i'm like hard pass <laughs> Or can we drink in there? Because that's what I would like to do. Fair. So, so you, you didn't do it. I, can't, I haven't done it yet. I can't do it. I, Are I don't you know claustrophobic like that? <laughs> really bad. Really bad. Even though it's glass and you can see, I, you can't do it, dude. I was locked in a cell in Alcatraz. <laughs> right. On accident, they closed it and they locked it and they couldn't get it open. And they're like, "Fuck!" And I had a, I had a claustrophobic panic attack. In a cell, it's as big as this. It's a cell. It's big. I could, and I started fucking. Like, hi, 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 hi. Yeah, I could not. I cannot. So wait, do you, hyperbaric chambers are really good for you, though. Oh my god, it saved me. Like it, like I don't have lasting effects. I think from that. Really? Oh yeah. Because it just oxygenates all your blood. Because I think in normal day to day life, we're getting like twenty percent oxygen and what we're breathing in but it's 100 percent oxygen and thus it's basically you're creating so many more red blood cells and it's just bombarding your tissue and your muscle and your fascia and it's all like it's just helping you heal life is fragile it's very fragile i'm reminded that by that uh, when i see my kids every day and just it's crazy to think that there are people out there that maybe aren't prepared and might leave their kids with a financial, huge financial burden. On that note, it makes sense why people get life insurance, especially term coverage, which is surprisingly affordable. Why not pay a little bit each month to protect the ones you love? If you're asking yourself this question right now, choose Ladder. Ladder is 100% digital, no doctors, no needles, no paperwork when you apply for $3 million in coverage or less. Just answer a few questions about your health in an application. All you need is a few minutes and a phone or a laptop to apply. Ladder's smart algorithm works in real time. So you'll find out instantly if you're approved. No hidden fees. Cancel at any time. Get a full refund if you change your mind in the first 30 days. Ladder's policies are issued by insurers with long, proven histories of paying claims. They are rated A and A plus by AM's best. Ladder customers rate them 4.8 out of 5 stars on Trustpilot. And they made Forbes' best life insurance of 2021 list. Since life insurance costs more as you age, now is the time to cross it off your list. So go to ladderlife.com slash Bert today to see if you're instantly approved. That's L-A-D-D-E-R life.com slash Bert. Ladderlife.com slash Bert. Yeah. Yeah, it was so wild. We, what's the tummy tuck like? It's great. They cut you from here to here, and they basically remove skin and... Basically, what happened was I went to the doctor, and because I was 110 pounds overweight, he was like, you have a hernia. And I was like, really? I, I don't feel it. He's like, yeah, well, you walk, you've been walking around with one for years, probably, from carrying around the weight. And he's like, and and God bless him, because he's like, and this skin, like, do you, how do you feel about it? Like, And I was like, well, I, I'd love it to not be there, but I've sort of made my peace about it. He's like, you should have a plastic surgeon fix you up and have the hernia fix and because you're going to be under anyway do this surgery like go to a guy who can do both for you because like you worked really like you did the hard part he's like and you're never it's never going to bounce back like just accept that but you can you can fix it and so yeah they cut you from here to here they remove it they sew you up and you kind of a and you get a cute little new belly button oh, they make fucking cute. they remake a belly button oh yeah you want to see no, uh-uh. <laughs> I, have, I, have a, I have a belly button thing. I have to see it Wait, now. I have to see it that, now. That might be the first time I've ever heard I have a belly button thing. I do. I have a hard time. <laughs> like, because so, I'm always shirtless, people put their finger on my belly button. They do? Uh -huh. What's wrong with what people? What the fuck's wrong with people is <laughs> right. What the fuck is wrong with those animals? Right. And so, uh, so... I mean, it's an inviting belly button. Can I see it? Yeah, sure. Let me see it. They yeah, just made exclusive. that? What happened to your other one? I know. It's somewhere. It's in a museum. <laughs> <laughs> my God, that's the craziest thing I've ever seen. It's cute, though. It's, it's cute. It's inviting. Thanks, 
a nice belly button. <laughs> My man. <laughs> Did you ever a part of you that was just like, let's just get covered in tattoos? Yeah, and not get the you surgery. you have one on your arm, right? Yeah, I just have like a couple little ones. My kid, my mom, my wife. Yeah, but nothing. Do you have one up here too? No, no. This is oh, just... It's just the oh, I saw the, it's the one on your forearm. Yeah, but um, just tattoos so that I to cover I don't up know, any cover up like the scars. I yeah, I, I think about it, but I, like I always think about. I was because Segura and I were thinking about getting tattoos to cover up these scars. Oh man, I just got stem cells. No way. How are we feeling? Fucking love them. Really. Love them. You didn't go to Columbia. You did it stateside. I did it stateside. I did it with uh, the or the yeah, like the, a, like, the, the hookup. The hookup, yeah. The the guy who does all the MMA fighters and does all the fucking yeah. And, and is it pretty instantaneous? No. Uh, so f- in for me, uh, I I get the day I got it. So I was having a hard time. Not a hard time. I'll show you, but not a hard time. But I was noticing that I could feel uh my where did my surgery happen like when i did this like uh, right like i just didn't i felt like an instability maybe hmm. like just getting up out of chairs like that or like getting into bed i was just and i maybe it was like me just still babying it and so i got the the stem cells and then and then i didn't notice didn't notice and then we went and did lifted weights at the gym in uh at penn state and and i was like all right and now the stem cell have been in for a week and so i lifted weights at penn state and it felt really strong and and then i did my tricep exercises and i noticed that it, i didn't have any pain I, I normally would have a little pain yeah the first few reps and i wasn't having any pain and i just felt really and everything felt really really good and and then i did like full but blown tricep or a full-blown tricep workout in penn state after we benched i did some I did everything and then and it and it's felt fucking amazing. And so wow. the, usually you feel the effects a week to two weeks after. But uh, I'm going back down. I'm getting it done again, and then I'm bringing my parents out. I'm getting my parents done, getting their knees done because they both have bad knees. Wow. I mean, I, I the certain things like uh, I was very against it. Why? I just don't know what it is. Yeah. You know, and I still kind of don't. But it's uh, what about like can you can you get the golden what's it called the golden stem cells like the IV drip one that they do in Colombia here? No, that well that, those are the ones that Drew Doctor Drew told me he was like right. Are you getting intravenous right. or are you getting? I would love to get intravenous now too. I'd get them all. Yeah, I think it's the thing. I think it's the key. My mom could use it. It just yeah. help her be more mobile. That's my my dad's not very mobile anymore. Like he is, but you can tell like it takes him a little bit to get out of the. Yeah. chair and and then and if you if, if it's depending what car you're in he get takes him a little while to get in and out of cars and i was like just keep fucking shoot up your knees you'll feel great you'll feel it kind of from what i understood she, she sonogrammed my arm mm. sonogram mammogram no sonogram Son- ultrasound ultrasounded my ultrasound. arm <laughs> also and uh she gave my arm a mammogram <laughs> <laughs> so and she was like uh here's the tendon where you have surgery here's the scar tissue on top of it huh uh, i'm gonna shoot it right in on that and and she's like and then i'm gonna prescribe you um fentanyl pr- no uh uh peptides to for your joints <sighs> to, they're gonna help lubricate your joints i gotta call her today actually i think that's um but i think peptides inevitably like when you get down to it are it's human growth hormone it's an antagonist for human growth hormone so it promotes your body to make more of it really i think so because i did a how, I did how a into of fitness it. are you i just move a lot to just stay like for my mental because i'm a sober guy and also just to like be able because like my diet sucks it doesn't suck but it could certainly be better mm-hmm. but i've gotten to this place i'm like well if i work out five or six times a, a week like a hike i'll i'll lift i'll do some boxing stuff then I can kind of eat like a slob two or three days a week and really not pay for it. So I found a balance. But I did I did a remake of uh, Turner and Hooch for Disney Plus last year. Yeah. And uh, and so they were like, we want you to get in shape because you're playing like a U.S. Marshal in proper shape. And I can't tell you how many people were like, oh, you'll do steroids, right? I was like, wasn't planning on it. They were like, everyone does them. And I was like, everyone. They're like, yeah. Anybody with a cape? No, <laughs> <They're> like <laughs> <laughs> you have to. I was like, I don't want, I don't want to. And so my, you know, Ben Greenfield. Yeah, yeah, and he uh, Ben Greenfield is 
fucking Shredded. next level. That yeah. guy, that guy. Uh, you know what I like about that guy? If he's going to recommend it, he's tried it. Totally. He's a fucking fascinating dude. I would yeah. like, I, I would love for, dude, he's sh fucking shredded. It's insane. He's, he's on some other level shit. Yeah. So what you were going to say, Ben Greenfield. So Ben Greenfield, I hit him up because he's a buddy of mine. And I was like, what do you suggest? And he's like, well, I have this doctor, Craig Conover, who's been on Whitney. I know, I know Dr. Conover. You getting your peps from, from Conover? Uh, no, I have. <laughs> he's, they're in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> My yeah. my wife, I remember when I was, she's like, "Why is there syringes in our fridge?" And I'm like, "Just overnight diabetic." No, yeah. <laughs> I was like, "It's fun." Um, but I, uh, yeah, so I talked to Doctor Conover, and he was like, "And I did them for like two months, and I, they certainly helped." Like, yeah. I think if you can like use them for like recovery or getting ready for a bit, you know, to be TV's low rent Tom Hanks, it's worth it's worth it. Yeah. What dog? What kind of dog did you have? French Mastiff. So such a great fucking dog. The best dogs. The one thing about them is they don't. They're not the most trainable. So <laughs> I remember it's the first. You know, we shot the pilot, and it's you know Mick G's directing the pilot. Like it's like a proper Mick G. Yeah, Mick G. He was the shit back when I was like in like ninety nine. Dude, his his music Man. videos were fucking awesome. He's a fucking. He, he, he did. He did. On. He did. Uh, Charlie's Angels. Yeah. And I remember going Terminator. Like, I remember going to see Charlie's Angels. Going, I'm going because of Mick G. He's a man. Yeah. And so he's directing and. And these dogs are the greatest. And we have five dogs and the trainers are, are beautiful. And it's the first day we're filming with the dog. And it's a scene where I've like got this, this guy like dead to rights at the end of an alley, but he's kind of hiding. I've got like my weapon drawn and I'm, and the dog has to follow me. And we do the first take and the dog trainer runs out and goes, no, 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 no. Dog can't be around that kind of energy. <laughs> and I go, what? And she goes, it's too intense. Can't be around the energy. Not good for the dog. I said, not good for the dog. <laughs> I go, it's a cop show. <laughs> I said, what kind of energy is good for the dog? <laughs> and she goes, not that. And and so Mick G comes over and he goes, no problem. Like, we, you know, and, and throughout the series, we're always like, whatever the dog is, is yeah. capable of doing and is happy doing, that's what they'll do and nothing more. And so he's like, we're going to shoot. We'll shoot Josh from behind and he'll just walk and the dog will be following him. Josh, you don't have to say anything. You don't have to be intense. Just like kind of put your arms up and walk down the alley. And there was a bit where the dog had to kind of be jumping at my arm. And I'm kind of like, no, 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 stay, stay. And so they were like, well, we have a trigger word for that. And I was like, great. What is it? And they were like, pew, pew. <laughs> so they say action. <laughs> and I'm like, peptide it up. <laughs> action here walking down this alley going, pew, pew, pew. <laughs> And that was like pretty much the next eight months, but it was a good time. Really sweet dogs. They yeah. just, you know, they're just like, we just, they want to chill. They're not like um, German shepherds or like the, that kind of breed where they're like, what do you need, boss? Somebody. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, we have bull mastiffs. Oh, so, really? Yeah. So we have, uh, and uh, they're, I mean, they're dumb as fuck. And they're <laughs> yeah. the dumb, two, two of the dumbest dogs you've ever. Mac is the actual dumbest dog. Today I went. And he, we have, because Izzy is constantly hurt. She has a, she ripped a toenail out. And so she has oh. a, I know, what oh. fucking shit piece of dog. Sucks. Yeah, fucking $2,000. Oh. So I don't even know how she ripped her toenail out. Who fucking knows? And then she ate it. <laughs> yeah. Sure. So yeah, blood everywhere. And she's chewing on her toenail. Oh. And Leanne's like, ah. In her defense, like, don't you eat your toenails? No. No. <laughs> no, I don't. You don't have, well, I heard you. What, what, what power are you saying that you eat your boogers? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll never live that down. <laughs> They were like, do you want us to take that out? And I was like, no, doesn't everyone eat their boogers? Not all of them, just the good ones. I don't eat my toenails, but yeah, sometimes like one will make its way into my mouth. And so so I smell them. I smell them. I, sure. I, smell them. I, my, I take them and I hold them up to my nose. And I go, mm -hmm. Me. Yeah. And so uh, today we have our, our pool is because we have a like a, a shelf mm. that you uh, the dogs will go sit on the shelf or just go p stand on the shelf and drink the pool water. <laughs> yeah. So, to, and we have it, we have it uh, quarantined off, like uh, gated off so they can't get the step. And today I walk out of here. This is right, literally right before I, I came back here. I walked in to grab a hat and Max standing on the shelf on the other side of the gate going, I don't know how to get out. I was like, how the fuck did you get in? Yeah. And he was like, I don't know how to get out. Like just staring at it. And I just went fine. 
let him in. I go grab a hat. I come back. The whole living room is soaking wet. I'm like, motherfucker. Oh, man. These dogs. This house is, you know, it's so funny. I said to Leanne, because we just, you know, we've only been here, I think, maybe under a year. Um, I said, this house is not very relaxing. Huh. She, goes, she goes, yeah. That's what a house should sound like. I go, there's constantly action. Like the dogs are doing something or someone's, there's there's a delivery at your front door and ev everything's fucking I was like, I didn't realize when I go sleep at a hotel, just how quarantined off you are. Yeah. Like when you're in a hotel, no one bothers you. That's quiet. And you got a three-year-old. Oh, yeah. And you're, you're, your life starts the second that child is awake. You don't get, you're like a farmer. You don't get to pick it. <laughs> no. And we have an agreement with him because sometimes he'll wake up dumb early. And so we'll say, Max, like in the morning, like, if it's not light out yet, then just like you can play with your toys a little bit, like just keep it low key. And he will. But now, you know, we're getting into April. And so with daylight savings, it's light at a oh, quarter to six. I missed. I go. I went. I went and hung out with Tom, with Tom Segura's kids. And I had a, me and Leanne and we had a great time. And yeah. I, I missed having kids. I really did. Because I was like, oh, so much fun. We were playing hide and go seek. And I was like scaring the fuck out of them and it was just a lot of fun like a lot of the things i excelled as a dad in in the play area like mm. playing i i remember the, one of the best compliments i ever got i'm learning a lot about myself but one of the best comments i ever got was uh one time we were at a party in georgia and i go dad can you come out to the pool and come up with a, a game and i was like sure so I, I tell my, I, I always, I love coming up with games for the yeah. kids. I always loved it. So I walk out to the thing and Georgia says to this pool full of kids, uh, my dad's here and my dad is awesome at coming up with games. Watch this, show him dad. And so I fucking stepped up my game and I was like, all right, everyone, this is a five pound weight. We're going to see who can swim it from one side to this side, but just holding it on their feet. And like, we just, and we just started fuck like, and then we, we, I would make up games. I would make. I was really good at making pool games, but that was one of my proudest moments. And then, so last night we were up at the beach, and yeah. uh, and we were gonna stay up there. And Georgia called and said, uh, said, "Hey, what are you guys doing tonight?" And Leanne's like, "I think mom, we're gonna stay up here." And she goes, um, "Okay," because I could kind of use a breakfast sandwich. And I, I was like, it was like the fucking, it was like. Oh, you need a breakfast sandwich? Okay. All right. Get in the car. We're going home. We're going home. Yeah. And so we came home last night and I woke up this morning. I made her the best motherfucking breakfast sandwich. It's fucking Walk us through. Give us give us a play by play. What Dude, what's a BK breakfast sandwich looking like? So what I this is a new thing I've been doing. Hmm. Hear me out on this. Please. So I uh scrambled egg. I go scrambled egg for the girls. So anything over they're in the car it's too stoppy Fair. scrambled egg but i scramble it soft i meaning i i le leave it a, just a titch runny low heat low heat constantly moving yeah and so uh two pieces of sourdough bro bread we have a griddle so i take them Yum. i butter both sides and i toast one then flip it a little salt on the bread Waffle house. then here's what i do that is a little different that i just started doing and i'm really proud of i take the cheese that i'm going to put on the bread shredded cheese and i throw it in the bowl where i had scrambled the eggs so it gets egg all over the cheese yeah then i put that cheese on the bread and as it toasts i think i feel like that egg meshes in with that cheese and really sucks it into that bread wow. so that it really sticks i throw the egg on flip it and then i just very low i very low toasted it so that it and very liberal with butter yeah. very low toasted it flipped it over and over and over and then isla was like hey can i get a piece of isla, isla was in a bad mood i said do you want something for breakfast she said no i said do you want anything she goes no i don't need anything i said i'm gonna make a piece of toast and you can take it with you and she goes lots of butter <laughs> and so i made i made just a piece of sourdough toast for isla buttered it put it on the griddle flipped it over little salt put it in and then i made leanne three very small breakfast chorizo tacos wow so uh I, I i i killed it and then i went i was like fucking everyone left and i was like i'm done i'm going into the bed i'm gonna take a little nap at 7 30 in the morning and fucking those goddamn dogs 
<laughs> there's the dogs and then Leanne has someone working in the house. Leanne always has someone working in the house. And the dogs, I, I, I get up, I go, they're fucking making so much noise, whatever. And they're out of the gates. They're fucking everywhere in the house. Max pissing on shit. I'm like, I just came back here and worked yeah. out. I was like, it's fuck big house dogs. problems. Yeah, well. But is that it, it, like you say your, your daughter Isla wasn't in the best mood. Is that a part of, I've had to learn this and being part of a bigger family now. Cause my wife comes as like, my wife is one of four. Like her dad was, you know, quarterback in the NFL. Like they're like a proper, like Wait, who is, who is she? Um, her dad's a guy named Ken O'Brien. Ken O'Brien. Yeah. Wait, I know Ken O'Brien for the, played for the Jets. Yeah. yeah. I know Ken O'Brian. I'm yeah. I married Shut his daughter. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. God damn it. And like, they're like this beautiful, perfect, like lovely family. And what I've learned through them, which was not true of me and my mom was like, being part of a big family means that someone might be in a bad mood and that has to be okay. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, because if it's you and your mom... Can't. It's like, we're going to fucking have this out because your life is one long car ride. <laughs> that's so insightful. <laughs> I love the way your brain thinks. Thanks. Our life is one big long car ride. That is fucking so insightful. Yeah. No, uh, yeah. Uh, so both my sisters are uh, emotional terrorists. <laughs> Solid. So like, they'll, they if they just like... My sister Annie would just be like, well, we can do it that way and I can decide to be a bitch. Is that what you're cool with? <laughs> and you're like, okay, I guess we're doing it your way. It's like, that's what I thought. Are you like, uh, have you ever seen Punch Drunk Love? Yeah. Like, remember Adam yeah. Sandler's sisters? Like, they were just like these totally domineering, like. Oh, yeah. And, no. And like, you just start smashing windows. No, eventually. my sisters are bullies. Meaning, I, I love my sister. I'm very close to my sisters. But they're bullies to me. They're just bullies. Like, they will consistently mock me like like i mean and it makes me laugh so fucking hard um and they've taught my daughters that and my daughters but like yeah if someone's in a bad mood usually is isla yeah in georgia georgia but they're, but they're they're but yeah you you i i'm usually go in for isla to squash her bad moods like i'm mm. the i'm the the i ice her because she's like if she's in a shit mood i can fix it usually yeah um i cannot fix georgia well there's like i that was something my and i think it was from my dad in that i always had this sort of like tony montana complex and <coughs> relationships or anything which was just like if anything bad happened if there was any like necessary conflict <coughs> i would just say no problem let me get out of here actually let me show you how good i am how how little i needed you in the first place oh my god that's fucking no no bueno no bueno and like I would leave and I was basically perpetuating the bad behavior of this guy. I never even knew because that was his. Oh, my God. MO. That's fucking insane. <laughs> it was fucking dark. <clears throat> and, and what I had to learn from my wife was like, no, no, no. Um, we can we can fight. We can even go to bed mad because family doesn't leave. So whether we figure this out tonight or tomorrow or the next day, where are you going? Family doesn't leave. And that was like groundbreaking for me so where did all this growth happen for you did it happen in recovery i think getting sober at 21 certainly helped like i just think i got sober so you've been sober for like 14 years yeah oh, <laughs> jesus yeah. it works for me do you feel like you kind of do you, do you kind of regret that you took your partying so aggressively that you that you can't just that i ruined it that you're like I, i'll never be able to just have a glass of wine i sometimes i the, the reality is I never wanted to like smoke weed and paint or like have a couple drinks and get on the dance floor. I wanted to be like, no, 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 the party's here. Like, let's bring the drinks and the drugs back to my, my apartment. Really? And let's just sit around and look at each other and talk and listen to like Richard Pryor records. Like that to me was a dream. Like I remember when I started to like really dive deep into like my vision quest of four years of <coughs> drinking and using, like I liked these sort of like, counterculture beatnik like weirdos who were like me who were like no, no no the party's here like let's make this a party I, I remember i used to go over to this guy's house and we'd get high and and then he had this guy hang out whose name was the professor and he would just get loaded and put me in jujitsu holds and i'd be like that hurts <laughs> like, yeah. but but i was just like yeah man the professor he's good as gold you know he just yeah. like has a small drug habit and so that was like appealing to me. It was never to like um, elevate the situation. It, it was the situation. So I, I knew that inevitably, like, cause I had been so overweight 
throughout my life. And then as soon as I lost weight, I transferred to this other thing that it was never, I just overdo it. I overdo it. It's so funny. I, I always, like I, I was not drinking. I'm not drinking for a while. Mm. But then last night, uh, Leanne opened a bottle of champagne and I was like, well, I, I, I was just seeing my wife for the first time and why yeah, wouldn't I have a glass of champagne with her? Yeah. And then I ended up drinking and then and then fucking on the ride home, I got a glass of wine and I was like, I was like, I got sip it on the ride home. Sure. And we pulled up and Leanne is like, Oh my god, it's a DY checkpoint. You gotta kill your wine. And Fuck. I went, Oh, it was a full it was a it was a fucking spliff of wine. And I just went, go, 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 go. <laughs> Poured it all over my chest, all over my chest, all over everything. <laughs> And then she goes, oh, never mind. It's an accident. Oh, shit. We got to turn around. And we just, I just murdered a wine <laughs> right before the, I was going to sip on it for the whole ride home on the 101. <laughs> but she, uh, yeah, but I, I, that, that's my problem with drugs and alcohol is like, I, uh, I feel like I respect, um, I, I don't know. I feel, I, I feel like I, I always, I always want to be able to enjoy a drink. Mm. Like I want to like, so I, 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 so I, I don't let myself go too far down the rabbit hole. Although I, I have, I mean, I definitely have. But you've always, I mean, I feel like even though drinking is like a thing that you're sort of public about that you certainly enjoy and do, it's like you've always been able to balance that. I mean, at least your any missteps never been public where you're like, fuck, I overslept this thing. Oh, I haven't. I, no. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm not. You're diligent. Well, I, I, I I'm also I, like, I, <clears throat> I'm really big on Irish goodbyes. Like I'm yeah. really big on knowing when I'm done. Like I, I pull the plug. My cousin will tell you anyone that travels with me. I just go, I'm done. Irish goodbyes. You just leave and you don't say goodbye. I just leave. Cause I don't, cause I, don't I thought that was a French goodbye. No, I think French goodbye means you stick around and you wait for Americans to bail you out. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's that joke about like uh, there's the German goodbye, <laughs> <laughs> or like there's a joke a Frenchman leaves without saying goodbye and a Jew says goodbye but never leaves. <laughs> That's an old Mel yeah. Brooks stroke. No, that I don't know about. No, Irish goodbye is just I was maybe I'm misusing it. It's just when you you just go. I'm drunk. I just walk out. No one sees me leave. Yeah. Like that's like, I remember one time when we first got to LA and we go out and people would be like, Hey man, where did you go? Mm. I was like, I went home. And they're like, yeah, but how? I was like, I just got in a taxi and I went home. Right. And they're like, and this is back, back when you had to call taxis. Right. And you'd, and they'd be like, <clears throat> you, what you're supposed you were out with us. We, we should take you home. And I was like, we're, we're not dating. No. Like, yeah. Once we get to the bar, it's every man for himself. I'm out. A hundred percent. And so. That's good self-care. Irish goodbye. Right. It's just without bidding farewell. Gotcha. Um, right. And so I do that. I I call, I call it a lot. Like, I'll, I'll just go like, I'm done. Yeah. And I'll just get in my bunk. I mean, if we're talking about. If we're t and I, my problem is I talk honestly. But my problem lately is. I have a vape pen in my bunk and I end up smoking weed in my bunk like all until like until I can't see. That sounds and like heaven. It's uh it's you, you it's watch something awesome. in that bunk, you got a nice like I it's I will listen to documentaries on Putin. I'm i I'm obsessed with uh Putin. <laughs> Just getting loaded Putin, listening to Putin. Hitler right now I'm in this five part series on Hitler. Mm. Um Is that that how to make a dictator show on it's so fucking Netflix? noiser? Yeah, yeah. It's so good. Yeah, De Stefano was talking I'm, I'm, about that. <clears throat> So I like to listen to the same one over and over again. Uh huh. Like I like to, like I listen to the Franco one probably twenty times. That guy's voice just fucking mesmerizes me. And so uh, I got this great fucking vape pen that's got Blue Dream, and Blue Dream is the perfect marijuana. It is the perfect blend of marijuana. As a matter of fact, today I will go and buy all the Blue Dream I can find because. Uh, it allows you to sleep yeah. soundly like 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 on, especially on a bus when you're moving around if if i take a few hits of blue dream i sleep through the whole fucking ride and i wake up and it's like a xanax like a xanax sleeps where like you'd wake up in the middle of the night and you'd be like oh, about I'm, I'm on xanax i can just go right back to bed right and i can't really fuck around with xanax anymore i mean i do i, I, I would from time to time but like but i i i'm too worried about my cognitive 
abilities. It and also has an amnesia effect, Xanax. So you have to yeah. be careful about. Yeah. Yeah. There's like I remember when I would you know when I was sort of taking everything, I I would take a Xanax on a plane and. What I would notice is I was totally aware of of the turbulence or mm -hmm. like these moments, but I I would for, like there's something that happens during even light trauma like turbulence where you're in fear right like a small sort of spike. By the of, way, what time do you need to get out of here? Uh, like ten ish. Sure. Does that work? Yeah, 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 yeah. But I imagine there's something that happens when you have that spike of epinephrine where it's like a, a like even a light trauma is embedded, right? Because you remember that feeling in your stomach drops of like, oh, God, we were flying over Milwaukee and, and we dropped 2,000 feet. Yeah. But with the Xanax, what it's doing is it doesn't allow you to sort of like ingrain those memories, right? Yeah. You're aware. You're not yeah. like loaded. You know what happened. But like it you, that same memory isn't locked into your sort of psyche. So you can't revisit it. Yeah, but the problem is with a guy like me, I find those traumas in the smallest fucking things. Yeah. So like, so like, uh, like, those traumas show up in a long line at the airport, mm -hmm. and so all of a sudden that trauma is like, and it's like, it's crippling. Yeah. And you're like, oh, that's. I mean, that's why I, I love Xanax. Man, it's still every now and then I'll take like a quarter of a milligram. Yeah. But uh, not often not often enough where and i've never gone through a full prescription it's, i always it's always expired by the time i get to get a new one it's one of those it's too good it's too fucking volume's pretty fucking awesome it's the same family benzodiazepines yeah, ben i mean i don't know yeah <laughs> no. klonopin out of van they're all yeah. in that family yeah. <laughs> i bet the whole o'brien family's good looking <laughs> i'm just guessing the same way the whole benzo family kind of works <laughs> My uh oh my god! I sometimes I wonder like what what my my in laws think of like this guy that my wife bought into like <laughs> the guy from Drake and Josh the weight loss not Catholic like former drug addict but they've they've embraced me wholly and I appreciate them. That's crazy. Have you ever had a catch with Ken? <laughs> yeah, it's bad. It's bad. It's like, Ow. <laughs> Dude, it's throwing a beer. Like you can't catch it here. Like yeah. her brother, shout out Kelly, he's the best. Um played division one for fresno state was the quarterback and he's six eight and he's like the love first of all her whole family are they're beautiful people but they're so athletically blessed in addition i remember i was dating my wife it was our second date and i show up at her house and her dad and her brother are playing catch in like the front yard like the front of the house do they live in la yeah they live in la and i just was like oh my god this is it like i'm gonna bobble this catch and this is gonna form their opinion of me forever They're like josh go deep and you're like um my father left <laughs> at a young age and i think that it probably why oh you didn't run oh okay my bad i do push-ups from my knees <laughs> I, do, I can't i do push-ups on my knees <laughs> I have a man named Ronaldo who has to hoist me as I try to do a single push up. That's fucking great. So I got on the phone and I walked up to the house and I was like, hey guys, sorry, I just have this call. It'd be ridiculous to throw it to me now. I'm on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> so, but then, like, once I got into the family, they started to, yeah, try to play catch with me. And it's bad, dude. And they, like my brother-in-law, who's the greatest, will sometimes be like, hey, remember that time in Tahoe where you didn't catch the ball? And I'm like, that was six years ago. <laughs> like, yeah, I can't get you, it out of my you mind. You would be the funnest brother-in-law. I'm a pretty good brother-in-law, I hope. Yeah, I'm a, I'm not a fun brother-in-law. No, because you come from a big family. Like, it's no, not, I just, the novelty well, wears off. I'm not a good anything, really. I'm pretty <laughs> self-focused. Yeah. Know, like, I just, I'm like, unless you want to talk to me about me, I'm like, I don't know. What, what do you want to talk about? I get it. Like, I'm, I... But you're I'm a good uncle. I'm a good uncle. But you I'm, are you're curious, which I think is a great sort of quality in people. Like you want to you want to know more about things. Yeah, I'm pretty harsh on myself. Like I, I like I, especially in public when we talk on podcasts. Mm. I'm pretty harsh on myself. In I scale it way more than you. The the word uh, is hyperbole. I speak in hyperbole. Mm. So everything I've always I'm always to the extreme when I d describe myself. So. When I say that I'm pretty self-focused, obviously I'm not. But to be anything less than that, I feel like is being disingenuous. Sure. So Because then if I tell you the other side, you're like, well, yeah, but you think about yourself a lot. And I'm like, I might as well just tell you that's the fucking the yeah. truth. But so is the book out right now? 
Uh, it's out right now. You can get it at Amazon, Diesel Bookstores, anywhere books are available. It's a great fucking cover, dude. Thank you. It's so punchable. Did you enjoy? Did you enjoy writing it? I did. Yeah, and I had my buddy Ryan Holiday. You know him. I do know Ryan Holiday. He wrote the Daily Stoic and Ego is the Enemy. And yeah, he basically I've known him for a long time. And I didn't want a ghostwriter, but I needed someone I could bother and just like someone who could be my editor and help with like pages and notes. So he helped me with the book and. Yeah, man, I, I basically just wanted to write like it's a, the book is a bait and switch, right? Like you see that cover and you go, oh, I know that that corny guy I grew up with. And then I just kind of talk about like the challenges in my life. It's like a, a it's a memoir hiding as a self. No, it's a self-help book hiding as a memoir. Well, your life is a self-help life. Yeah, you've taken I mean, I, I'm very impressively you've taken what a lot of kids could not would would be trauma in their lives for the rest of their lives and in in three different aspects you know weight gain uh not knowing your father losing your father and 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 drug addiction and fame and losing fame and regaining fame right that's the one thing i regret i didn't talk to you about but i would love to have you back on the podcast yeah i'd love to because i really i mean honestly the wackness is one of my favorite fucking movies and and it's so funny that i didn't realize i was talking to you until last night that it was you from the whackness. Yeah. But um, but you've taken all these things and you and you've in a weird jujitsu professor kind of way, turned them against themselves to work for you and it made you a better person. And in listening to you and following you, your perspectives, they don't seem like they're fucking horseshit. They seem like they're Ben Greenfield, you know, like yeah. Ben does not come at you from a bullshit angle. And everything you do, you, you just seem so well-rounded. That's why I say you'd make a great brother-in-law. You just seem fun, and and I'm really happy for I'm really happy for you. you. You're the kind of guy that you go, yeah, maybe I guess I could, should quit drinking. It seems like he's having a good time with it. It's not great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, bro. This is a dream. I, I no, really appreciate it. I'm like such I a said, fan. I, I would love to have you back on the podcast anytime, anytime. You're uh, you're very easy to talk to. Ah oh, man, same here. I, I'd love to. Maybe we could do peptides together on the pod. A little stomach shot. Let's do it. Maybe <laughs> you can it. show me how to inject. Cute. <laughs>